Good morning, Maryland. Welcome to our first virtual planning commissioner training, planning board, board of appeals training. This is hosted by the Maryland Department of Planning in cooperation with the Maryland Planning Commissioners Association, otherwise known as MPCA. My name is Chuck Boyd. I'm the director of planning coordination for the Maryland Department of Planning. I want to welcome you to our training. Uh, and want to thank you, uh, particularly to our elected officials and appointed officials for your service and for you taking this training. Uh, many of you are taking it, as you know, because of the requirements of, of the land use article section uh, 1-206 that requires planning commissioners that uh, within the first six months of their appointment, they take the training. So we are excited for you to be with us and um, are hoping you get um, some meaningful information out of our training session today. We're going to cover things such as comprehensive planning, um, dealing with uh, special exceptions, subdivisions, variances, um, and hopefully um, we'll, we'll be able to catch a, a few uh, ideas from you and comments from you throughout the session. Um, we uh, have found um, that uh, this is most beneficial in person where we learn from each one of you. So. Uh, Unfortunately, we're going to be uh, doing this uh, instead of the, the 10 times we've done this uh, for the 10 years we've been doing this uh, in person with cancellations of the MAKO and the MML conference uh, and do the, the, the pandemic. Uh, this will be our first uh, um, virtual training session. So please, please forgive us today. Uh, we know we're going to have some te technical difficulties. Uh, and uh, we'll hopefully get through that. We have uh, uh, registered over uh, 150 uh, people today, so we would um, uh, we're not able to do some of the uh, interactions and unmuting that we would normally uh, have with uh, a, a smaller group. Um, so uh, please uh, give us your comments, and I'll go through the instructions about that in a second. We are recording this session, so uh, just so you know, um, we'll be uh, looking to uh, put this uh, new video on our uh, Planet Commissioner training site. We're going to be redoing that a little bit, so uh, I encourage you to uh, um, take a look at the, the Planet Commissioner training. Um, for free to contact me at any point if you have any suggestions on how we can improve our, our services to our Planet Commissioners. Um, and at, also, at the end of this completion of this uh, uh, session, we'll be sending out a certificate to the uh, uh, planning commissioners and board of appeals members. Um, and we'll also include a link to the uh, uh, PowerPoints that we're going to present today. So please uh, uh, look for that as long as well. So for those that are participating, haven't participated in the webinar before, we have a, a little cheat sheet here on, on the screen for you to see some of the uh, important information about how to use GoToWebinar. Um, if you have a question, and, and I encourage you throughout the, the sessions uh, to please uh, use that question as often as you think of something that you want to talk about. I will be moderating many of the, the, the sessions in terms of uh, asking the, our, our uh, presenters uh, your questions. So also I want to point out uh, on that uh, panel to the right, there is a uh, handout. That handout, uh, please take a look at that. That handout is our agenda for today. Uh, it lays out the different sessions and approximately how long they will be. Again, this is uh, uh, based upon our experience it, with an in-person uh, audience. So uh, uh, we anticipate running the same, but it'll be a little bit different without uh, uh, people asking questions along the way. But again, please uh, feel free to uh, put your comments in there. Particularly during the law and ethics session uh, uh, presented by Paul Kukuzela, um, he, he'll be uh, going through various topics, and I will closely monitor the the question box during that to see if there are specific comment or questions about 
um, topics that uh, uh, he's raising that you may particularly find uh, of interest or have a, a unique question to your jurisdiction. So uh, we have found that the, the law and ethics session is the most engaging. And so we want to try to replicate that as much as possible. So uh, I know it's easiest to raise your hand and and, and ask a question normally, but uh, uh, please indulge us and, and do share those questions with us so that, because your question undoubtedly is something someone else is wondering along the way. So I encourage you to participate and include those questions. And I will uh, um, uh, make sure you get a chance to, to do that. At the end of each session, we will have a question and answer uh, period, but uh, you don't have to wait until that portion of it. So for the first thing we want to do today is we want to get an idea of where people are in the state of Maryland. Um, so you, this slide shows the different regions. And in a second, uh, uh, my trusty uh, partner, um, is John Coleman, is going to throw up a PowerPoint, uh, excuse me, a, a poll. Please take a second and actually click on which of the regions you uh, are from. Um, I also note, please, in all of these polls, and we're going to do several of them, if you're not able to vote and you're unable to get to it, uh, click on the full view button um, in the control panel uh, so that you can uh, actually get to the polling. So if that's a problem with you, please uh, uh, make sure that uh, you're actually able to open the poll to uh, get to that. I'm going to give you a um, a couple more seconds to uh, indicate where you're uh, located at. And the results are, oh, and good. We have a good distribution throughout the the, uh, uh, the state. Uh, Eastern shore uh, uh, is double loaded because you've got Eastern lower uh, upper shore. Uh, and so Eastern shore, 35%. Congratulations, Eastern shore, well represented. Central Maryland, uh, and then uh, followed up by the Maryland capital, uh, Southern and Western. So we have great distribution throughout the state. Great, wonderful. Thank you so much all for participating. So the next question, we really wanna get a sense of um, who's here and, and best describe your actual, um, what role you play in planning activities. So here's the second question. Uh, Please click on which uh, role best describes what you do at the local level in local planning. I want to see uh, who's on our audience and that this will help us gear some of our uh, presentations a little bit more towards the, the participants along the way. Give you a couple more seconds to uh, tell us which one you are. Very good, excellent. Planning commissioners, uh, uh, then staff, great, great, excellent. Uh, uh, I'll just say also from the staff's perspective, uh, we make this offer when we're not in a pandemic. Uh, we, we do this road show three times a year normally at MAKO, MML, and at uh, MPCA conference. Um, and uh, we offer to, Again, we're back to hopefully close to normal. Uh, we offer the, the ability to go and schedule a, a special training in uh, different parts of the, of the state. So let me know. Um, so again, who's taking this, th this training? Uh, well, this does is a requirement, as I mentioned before, under the land use article for the uh, non-charter as well as charter counties, and planning commissioners, board of appeals members. Um, and so that's why I think you're here, but you may be here just to just learn more about it. So uh, we appreciate all that are here for the training today. I also want to welcome uh, and thank you everyone um, regarding uh, those that are participating today. Next slide. Um, so in addition to the training that we have, uh, Today, we also have an online training. As I mentioned earlier, we're going to put this video there. Uh, but uh, 
uh, that, that training uh, module is is a couple of years old, so we're actually updating it. So uh, it, it, it takes a little bit deeper dive into each of the sections. So I encourage you, if you really want to get the more into that portion of that, feel free to do it. Uh, there's a little bit of uh, reading, but it, it's pretty painless. Uh, and at the end, you can participate. If you're able, to, if if one of your uh, uh, commission members are not able, you're able to uh, participate and get a, a certificate through that. So it's pretty easy. It's painless. You know, I thank everyone for. Particularly, want to thank our planning commissioners, uh, board of appeals members, and the elected officials. Uh, thank you for your service. It's really important for us to to know that. Uh, um, that, that we appreciate your service. So I want to thank you for that particularly. So at this point, I want to introduce our uh, individual speakers. Uh, Keith Lackey is our regional planner from the, the Lower Eastern Shore. Um, he will be going over the foundations portion of planning, uh, has a wealth of experience, particularly working with smaller jurisdictions in the Eastern Shore. Paul Kukazella is Maryland Department of Planning's counsel. And um, he's going to go, obviously, over the law and the ethics portions of our training. Joe Griffiths is our manager of planning and local assistance training. Uh, he's going to go over the, the comprehensive planning process and the role of the planning commissioners. And then finally, I will uh, uh, follow up with a, uh, uh, a quick run through of the growth management tools that local governments have available to them. Uh, at all times. So without any further ado, I am going to now turn it over to Keith and then for him to introduce the foundations of planning. Welcome, Keith. Again, uh, you, you. we're getting we're good again, Keith. There, okay. Thank yes. you. Hello, thank you. Um, my name is Keith Lackey, and I'm regional planner for the Lower Eastern Shore, which is uh, Talbot County down the rest of the shore. And our first uh, technical difficulty has presented itself. I couldn't get unmuted there for a second. But also, I want to tell you that I will be the only presenter that will be asking someone to advance slides for me, and that's because I have three short videos and an audio clip in this brief presentation that I could not figure out how to move forward myself. So Chuck mentioned that this is a requirement within the land use article. It was a, as a result of the 2009 Smart Sustainable Community Act uh, that Planning Commission and Boards of Appeals members take this training. And it was a governor appointed task force um, that had members of MML, Maryland Municipal League, Maryland Association of County Officials and MPCA developed this uh, education course with uh, our department's assistance. Next slide, please. So this is a fairly uh, evident slide. What, what makes Maryland unique? If you've been a resident of the state for a while, you know that we are very close to several municipal, uh, large scale uh, cities such as Norfolk, uh, Virginia Beach, Baltimore, DC. Um, but also we have this uh, great variety of features such as the mountain, the Ridge and Valley area in the Appalachian, Western Maryland. Um, we have our coastal plain area that has uh, the Eastern seaboard, you know, and the, the beaches um, associated with that. And we have this great uh, amount of his historic structures as well that make it very uh, appealing for people to come and live here. Next slide, please. We are a very small state in comparison to others. The only states that really are smaller in size are the New England states. But we, next slide, please. We are the fifth densest state uh, as far as population, approximately uh, average of 600 people per square mile. But um, this presents both challenges and opportunities. And as planners, what we strive to do is to accommodate the, the uh, rather dense population without affecting natural resources in the area. 
And next slide, please. I don't have much to say about this uh, other than uh, this shows some of the unique built environments that we have in the state. And if you go to the next slide, we will see the more natural environments that I spoke of earlier as both professional and citizen planners and just the citizens of the, citizens of the state. What we try to do is to determine an efficient use of the land to accommodate uh, you know, homes, businesses, jobs, public services. But at that same time, we need to be very cognizant of the need to protect farms and natural resources, the Chesapeake Bay and, and its water quality as well. Next slide, please. Uh, we um, skipped our first, there we go. John, if you could start that video for me. I am hoping that everyone could hear that. I could not. Well, all right. I I'm not able to hear that, John. So, so I so uh, Keith. Um, neither the, neither I could hear it, so I don't think John, John is either going to try one more time, uh, or okay. you could describe it generally. Okay. I think he's. I think it's going to start now. Okay. Now, Worcester County is primarily rural. Uh, about eighty-eight percent of the land is zoned for agriculture, uh, and that's similar to the amount of, of land that is actually in agriculture and forestry. Uh, of course, Worcester County has a great tourism industry with Ocean City, uh, Berlin, Pocomoke, and Snow Hill. Uh, and outside of that is really nice rural country land uh, based, you know, basically which exists because of the zoning that we have in Worcester County. Farming has a really long history. It, it goes back to the colonial days. Um, and in fact, a lot of the Eastern Shore is known for still having kind of a colonial landscape intact. Um, it's, it's a major industry. Our agricultural areas had a, a density of one dwelling unit per two acres, so there was a lot more um, development potential. It's now basically at one dwelling unit per 30 acres. Okay. Um, there, thank you, John. So we have this rich history uh, in our state, a lot of uh, historic structures I spoke about earlier. The Maryland Historical Trust is part of the Department of Planning. And since the beginning of the Sustainable Communities Tax Credit Program in 1996, the, the uh, MHT, Maryland Historical Trust, has helped to rehabilitate uh, over 4,500 historic buildings, create approximately 25,000 jobs, and invest over $350 million within all the 23 count counties in Baltimore City. And the next will be the last of the videos you will be subjected to. John, we need to advance the slide. Reclaiming an existing underutilized building is inherently sustainable due to the avoided impact that repurposing something that's already been built is, you know, there's an old saying that the greenest building is the one that's already built. Okay, next slide, please. Thank you. So to accommodate the growth that we have, planners will produce plans and develop, to redevelop and develop uh, in strategic areas and to provide for places for us to live, work, and recreate. And if John, you will go through the next four slides at a moderate pace. This is one a city I'd like you to identify, think about. And if you'll go to the next slide. Thank you. So as you can see, that's one of our cities. It's quite, um, quite beautiful. And we hold it up as one of our uh, model communities. Next slide. So there is a, a long history of planning in the state. Um, New York City was the first in the country to create a comprehensive zoning that uh, 
regulated height and bulk, and dis, uh, and it was held, upheld by uh, courts to this um, this use of zoning. The gentleman that you see on the left is uh, Edmund Bacon. He was a longtime planning director for Philadelphia, and um, he is one of the um, one of the historical planners that we hold up as being a, a, a person important to our trade. And to the lower right, the man with a very um, stern look is Edmund Bacon. I'm sorry, I said that. Daniel Burnham. Mr. Burnham uh, has or had created several plans that um, we have to um, see on the ground today, such as uh, some of his involvement in Washington, D.C. And if you will go to the next slide, you can see this is a picture of one of his plans and that radial design uh, probably looks familiar to you. Um, one of the things that we had as far as, fine, you can leave it there, John, thank you. Um, one of the things that we have migrated from in the early 20th century where we were industrializing ourselves and had this huge infrastructure to accommodate uh, population booms, we have um, in the mid 20th century migrated towards um, the um, the advent of large highways that led out of these cities and promoted some exurban uh, flight. And um, so this has now led us into what I would term local uh, next generation planning, where we are looking at redevelopment and revitalization. And we're trying to get people back into these built environments because the flight of those urban areas caused a great stress on cities with respect to trying to afford to upkeep the existing infrastructure in place while ratepayers were fleeing the jurisdiction. Um, it's good that John had that slide up. There's a lot to read there, but I will just say this is part of what's called the Chicago plan that Mr. Burnham was a part of, um, and this was in early 1900s, 1909. The thing that's important and the reason we have this slide in here is that the this plan actually had a great deal of implementation that was done from uh, uh, 1912 to 1931, where there were uh, Chicago approved 86 bond bills to uh, actually construct many of the projects. 17 of the projects that were recommended in the, uh, the Chicago plan were brought about to fruition. And that is a good message because sometimes we, our planning documents often rest on a shelf and not, not, not be implemented. Next slide, please. So we're looking for a sustainable and efficient use of the land. We want to be able to time infrastructure and size it properly, water, sewer, roads, and schools to accommodate growth. But at the same time, we need to be cognizant of the protection of sensitive areas. And uh, as a part of all of that, there are many that are um, concerned with, appropriately concerned with, which is the economy. And so we need to uh, consider where, where it is that we can um, focus our economic growth and if you go to the next slide, John, and this is a play. When I first started as Senate in Centerville, I had come from the Parks Board and I was very familiar with what I had to do on the Parks Board. However, when I got to the Planning Commission, I will have to admit I was just completely lost. And that's one of the reasons I got involved with MPCA is that I felt that that was a group that might be able to help me through networking and training understand what I had to do in the job. Thank you. And that was Bob Elliott. And he was very instrumental in the early days of this training. Many of you probably saw him at Maryland Municipal League or MACO conferences. He would have a MPCA booth, and uh, he always had some neat tchotchke to hand off to people to get keep them uh, nearby so he could talk to them. And so, um, we, um, I'm not going to uh, bore you with reading a lot of this stuff, but we have to understand this physical uh, and, um, and demographic interrelationships for, and plan for schools and transportation. We need to listen to the citizens so that we can gauge what their desires are. Next slide, please. So 
the state of Maryland holds planning and zoning authority. And if you are interested in taking a note for the quiz that's coming up, I will repeat that the state of Maryland holds planning and zoning authority, but it is delegated to the local jurisdictions, both counties and municipalities through the land use article. There are other uh, types of regulations such as water and sewer master plans, non-title wetlands, forest conservation act, other laws that are uh, affected at the state and, um, and oftentimes administered at the local government. If you go to the next slide, please. Many of you have had uh, long-term tenure with either planning commissions or boards or uh, elected officials will remember the days of Articles 28 and 66B as being those statutes that delegated local authority that has been recodified as the land use article. There's two sections, one that applies to the um, former Article 66B, uh, counties and municipalities, and then the second division is for the area covered by the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission for land use uh, authority in Montgomery and Prince George's County. Next slide, please. There, is, there are a lot of subtle differences between what charter and non-charter counties can do and, and actually do. I'm not um, an expert on that, but these differences are uh, not, well, the differences are with, for instance, bond issuances and local law establishment. But the, the important takeaway from this particular slide is, is that both charter and non-charter counties have to address uh, parts of that land use article for the delegated planning authority. Next slide, please. Of all of these bullets that you see here, the, the most noted is the fourth, uh, or uh, yes, fourth, fifth bullet, uh, Euclid versus Ambler Realty. This was the 1962 Supreme Court case. I'm sorry, I should not have said that. That was a 1926 uh, Supreme Court case uh, for the village of Euclid versus Ambler Realty that upheld the government's authority to plan and to zone through the use of the police power, more specifically the general health, safety, and welfare of the public. Uh, the last of, of these bullets talks about the Federal National Environmental Policy Act that required federal government to consider environmental impacts for any of its proposed activities. And you hear the acronym NEPA, frequently used NEPA studies that comes as a result of that particular law. Next slide, please. We were the first state in the country to have a state planning commission. Um, our department, the Department of Planning, was established in 1959. And there's a, a list of some of the various acts in, uh, that the legislature adopted um, up to and through the Sustainable Communities Act, which many of you are probably familiar with or is, with respect to getting a sustainable communities designation to make you eligible for state funds such as the Community Legacy Fund and the Strategic Growth and Demolition Infrastructure Fund. Um, and next slide, please. I'm going to talk very briefly about priority funding areas because um, others will be uh, having more to discuss this, but this is a term probably fairly commonly uh, known by people attending this webinar. Um, the intent of the Priority Funding Areas Act was to make the most efficient use of the taxpayer dollars while maintaining existing neighborhoods. And um, the areas that were in municipal limits as of the effective date of January 1, 1997, were considered predefined priority funding areas that were eligible for state funding. Next slide, please. One of the things that's important to realize is, is that the way the public, uh, the priority funding areas law was enacted, it left the actual designation of priority funding areas and the local government's uh, purview. And we gave, as a part of the law, certain conditions for which the state would agree to those local designations. So you will see three different types of designations typically on our priority funding areas maps. Those are county certified areas that are eligible for state funding. This is where the county locally designated it and the state agreed that it met the state criteria for being a priority funding area. And then you'll have municipal priority funding areas that are similar to the 
county version. And then it, most notably, you will see what are called comment areas where local jurisdictions designated an area as a priority funding area, but the state did not concur that it met all of the requirements. And so while recognized as a priority funding area at the local level, it is not eligible for state funding. Next slide, please. So this just shows um, what has come as a result of Priority Funding Areas Act, and that's a steering development to the areas that are more able to provide for the infrastructure associated with growth and development. And the reverse side of that is that we have preserved a great deal of the acreage that is more natural and in, in, uh, natural resource or agricultural forestry based. And so these are just uh, slides that show what that, um, how that can be depicted. And I will say that over the recent years, we've seen a trend to have even a higher amount of growth being steered towards the priority funding areas than in past reporting periods. It's probably about a 75-25 split between um, areas that are developed in the priority funding area. We have just a couple more slides. The pain will soon stop. Here are some trends that are worthy of note. We have about 600 new jobs anticipated by the year 2040. We need to work on this uh, movement of jobs outside of urban communities. I will say that's a difficult nut for planners to crack because of the advent of technology. And I, I don't know if you have been working from home as I have for the past four months, but it's not too difficult to step away from the office and be able to still do our jobs. In our next slide. I am not going to read all of this to you, but an important thing to understand, we think, is, is that for about the past 30 years, we have had uh, a great deal of development activity in the state, about 650,000 acres, and it took us the previous 300 years of our Maryland history to develop that same amount of uh, land and convert it from natural to built environment. So that is something that we need to just keep in our minds. And we now have a few questions that I think John will be taking. Okay, so the first question uh, of our, uh, just to make sure that you were listening to Keith is, uh, please indicate, uh, uh, whether or not you think the statement is true, Maryland is the fifth most populated, uh, densely populated state. True or false? Remind you, if you're having difficulty voting, to go to full view button. Or yeah, click on the full, uh, click on it so that you you escape from the full view so that you're able to get to it. And the results are, the answer is true, 79%. Uh, Maryland is the the, uh, mo the fifth most populated. So that's a true statement. Next question. So uh, just, just so you know, uh, one of the things that we are finding out is when we had limited number of questions and uh, mm -hmm. webinars, so there are a few that, that uh, uh, and if you were an in-person, you'd hear me say this, that uh, when in doubt, always go all the above. So uh, uh, you're going to see several all the above questions, and this is one of those. Uh, by Maryland's 2040, Maryland is expected to, A, 800,000 new residents, B, 320,000 additional households, C, 600,000 new jobs, or D, all of the above? And the answer is D, all of the above. Um, next question is, why do we plan? Plan to A, guide land use, to B, to provide infrastructure, C, protect natural resources, D, foster economic community development, and you guessed it, E, all of the above is the answer. Next question on our quick poll is, where do Maryland jurisdictions get their planning authority? This one, we want you to, you, you can answer this one. A is governor, B, the United Nations, 
C is the, the land use article. D is the Maryland Department of Planning. And the answer is, the answer is the land use article. Uh, the depart you don't want the Department of Planning definitely to give you your planning authority. So it's definitely not us. Uh, and the governor uh, uh, is important, but uh, uh, the, the Maryland legislature's land use article is the, uh, uh, the place where local governments are delegated their planning authority. And the next question is about prior funding areas, priority funding areas, and select uh, the one that you think is the most accurate. Yep, the, the the number one answer and the correct answer is make most efficient use of tax dollars. Um, air, uh, the areas are uh, are not drawn by the state. Actually, local governments must actually draw the priority funding areas. Uh, and uh, only a few air, uh, municipalities uh, back in 1997 were uh, the initial priority funding areas, but uh, counties can also designate priority funding areas as well. So, uh, uh, okay. And so I have been monitoring the uh, potential questions out there. Uh, and um, unfortunately, Keith, no, take no offense about this, but I don't see a whole lot of questions out there. So I'm going to give a couple uh, minute or so if there's anyone that wants to ask questions during the foundation section to uh, uh, ch chat them in and put them into that question box and fire them to me. I do have a question uh, for Paul, so uh, that's great. Uh, any other questions, please uh, uh, feel free to, to enter into uh, the question box. Um, oh, I've got a question here. Wasn't the PFA uh, concept supposed to go away in a, a few years ago? Um, I guess the, an the short answer is not that I'm aware of. Uh, the PFA concept has been uh, debated. Priority funding area has been debated many a times. Uh, sometimes uh, it's been per uh, perceived many times to uh, restrict uh, the, the ability for local governments I will note that uh, one of the challenges with priority funding areas, it, the, when the law was created, it did uh, establish, uh, you know, what areas the state should work with local governments to concentrate growth and identify the areas that that, it, that they uh, weren't as high a priority. Uh, it's important, uh, and, and therefore, there's at least a little bit of prioritization, uh, hence the word, uh, of trying to uh, provide some um, concept to air in that area. So the one thing to think about in that respect is that uh, at least it's a more directed area. Um, and, uh, and I will say that uh, uh, we continue to work with local governments to address their priority funding areas to find those targeted areas. Um, what, in, um, got a lot of, what effective PFA, what happens if, if those areas uh, are common? Okay, I can talk about that in a second. That, oh, well, I've got lots of questions on PFA. Uh, so I'm going to try uh, to answer the ones at a time. So PFA common area, the state law says that a prior funding area uh, can be is located, designated by the local government and uh, is to be submitted to the state for uh, its review, the Maryland Department of Planning. And allow, the law allows for the Department of Planning to comment. The only time we comment on a PFA is when it doesn't meet the criteria of the PFA law. That is, it either doesn't meet the density, it's not currently in the water and sewer service area, it's not designated in your comprehensive plan as a growth area. 
those are the main criteria, uh, and we will only comment if it doesn't meet those. And um, we then work with the local government to try to address those comments so that we can remove it because we have no we have no desire to comment on a property. And what the comment does is the comment informs one of the state agencies that actually has a, a program that's subject to the PFA law to recognize that that, uh, that that area is not necessarily meeting all the PFA requirements and the local and the state agency addresses that. Um, and let me let me go back up with PFA just real quick on on the clarification of what the PFA law is. The PFA law addresses only a, a small subset of state funding. So the the state funding for uh, added capacity to highways is a, it is a subject to the PFA law. If you want to get funding through Maryland Department of the Environment's Water and Sewer Services uh, for uh, capacity improvements, that's a that's a that's a funding error uh, through the PFA. That's subject to PFA law. If you want to use community development uh, Department of Housing Community Development's um, Neighborhood Revitalization Program, Sustainable Communities, Rural Legacy, that area needs to be designated. It. If uh, the state is to locate a new public facility uh, or to lease land, they're supposed to put them in the PFA. Um, and I'm trying to recall if they're, oh, commerce. Commerce in terms of uh, the uh, investment in uh, economic development is supposed to be PFA. There are exceptions to that process. And we, we work with local governments and our state agency partners to address those times that we can't actually have exceptions. Um, let me quickly go through uh, what effect has uh, happened. Uh, hopefully I've answered that one. Does the PFA created by municipal have to be approved by the county? No, the county does not have to approve a PFA uh, that's established by the municipality. Only thing a PFA has to do is it has to meet those requirements. If it doesn't meet those requirements, when you submit it to us, we have a statewide map that's on our, our, our website. Uh, it's an interactive map. That's where we post and, and show all of the PFAs. So the municipality can do it with, uh, doesn't have to get a concurrence by the county. Uh, what do you think of today's uh, greatest challenges are? Um, there are a lot of those. Municipalities and counties for PFA determination. Again, uh, municipalities do their own. Uh, is school construction funding tied to PFA? The answer is yes and no. Um, generally, there's a process of going through it and getting site approval for a new school site. Uh, for a school site, the, the, the regulations for school, new, siting a new school says that it's to be um, located in a priority funding area whenever possible. School funding is not restricted at all with respect to rehabilitations and all those kinds of things. Only when you need to create like a new school or replacement school. And again, we work very closely with local governments to 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 accommodate uh, schools. So uh, school construction funding is uh, generally not subject to it, except for when you're building uh, a brand new school. Uh, when when you add on to an existing school, usually that's something that that is not as much of a problem. Uh, but again, if it's an existing school, we would work to to make it not be a problem. Those appear to be the questions. I hope I've answered those. Uh, uh, Keith, I'm hoping you're still on there. I want to thank you so much for being a uh, panelist now. And uh, at this time, I'm going to uh, segue and turn it over to Paul Kukazella, our uh, Department of Planning Council, to go over law and ethics. Uh, welcome, Paul. Paul has self-muted. He needs I, to unmute him. Sorry. <laughs> All right. I am now unmuted, correct? Yes. Okay. You're good. I'm good. Yes. And hey, hey, John, what do I do with my screen here? 
sharing. I think, nothing. I think you're exactly you're where you need to be. You're, you're exactly where you're going. Oh, you, you lost. There you okay. go. Just, okay. just, just page forward or, or, or arrow forward. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Paul Kukazala. I am a counsel to the Maryland Department of Planning and Historical Trust. Um, I'm uh, obviously used to giving this presentation in front of the group and uh, welcome and encourage um, interaction, uh, questions as we go. So uh, as, as uh, Chuck uh, mentioned, um, if, if, as you have questions, please, please uh, put them in the chat. Uh, Chuck will be monitoring them and um, and and will interrupt me as I go uh, if if he thinks that there's a question that that uh, that I can answer um, instead of waiting to the end. Yes, yeah, so um, Paul. Just, just uh, sorry. Just just uh, I may forget this. This was asked right at the beginning, so I'm just going to put it in your memory to room. It's it's dealing with the ethics side, of the recusal. Should a planning commissioner recuse themselves from discussion and vote on a final plat approval for a section of the development where they live? So keep that in mind when you get around yeah. to it. And I'll try to uh, um, yeah. uh, remind you about the recusal of where they live. Yeah, I, I, I think the short answer to that is yes, uh, but we'll get to that as uh, that, that's, that, that uh, segment of the, of the, the course is, is at the end. Um, okay. Um, so here's what we're going to go over today. Um, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the legal authority for planning and zoning. Um, then uh, a, a bulk of today's presentation and, and really the part that, that normally elicits the most interest is, um, is the constitutional limitations on uh, planning and zoning authority that um, everybody sort of has to keep in mind. Uh, the, the, the goal of this presentation isn't to make you all experts on, in land use law. Um, it's really just to sort of highlight issues for you. So as, as, you, as, you, um, as, you're, as you're working your plans and, and um, doing your jobs, if you stumble upon an issue uh, that um, um, you recall from this presentation, uh, re really, that just signals to you it's probably time to go talk to the lawyers. Um, so we, in, in the practice of law, we call it issue spotting. Uh, all this presentation is meant to do is make you aware of issues to help you issue spot. And once you've issue spotted, you know you need to go speak to your town attorney, your county attorney, or so forth and so on. Um, then uh, after we talk about some of the constitutional limitations of planning and zoning, uh, we'll talk some Maryland specific stuff. And then uh, lastly, we'll talk about government ethics. Um, okay, so um, let, let's let's talk about uh, the authority to uh, plan and zone. So we we, we start with the Tenth Amendment to, to the Constitution. Um, basically, what the Tenth Amendment says if uh, is that all um, uh, all powers, all governmental powers that are not delegated to the to the federal government are reserved to the states or to the people. Um, uh, and reserved powers include the police power. Uh, police power is government's authority to regulate and protect health, safety, and welfare. So, so the police power is, is specifically uh, reserved to the states. Um, so uh, so the, 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 the authority for governments to uh, govern, pass law, and regulate on health, safety, and welfare is a state power that uh, that most states delegate to local governments. So the police power is the basis for uh, zoning. Um, if, if, you, if you look to what zoning accomplishes, um, zoning um, uh, limits people's um, property interests. So if I have a piece of property, and it's zoned residential, uh, I, have, I have lost some of the bundle of rights that come with that property. I can't do whatever I want with that, that property. My property rights are not unfettered. So, so there has to be some authority for the government to be able to take those property rights away from you. Um, and that authority is, is, uh, is, that authority is housed in the police power. Um, and the court 
in uh, 1929 in uh, Euclid versus Amber Realty. Uh, uh, the Supreme Court first recognized zoning as a valid exercise of the police power. And what the court rationalized was, was a, 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 a essentially as, as our populations and our concentrations of people and uses of land got more complex, there is a rational government interest in, um, in placing uses into zones so as to protect the public safety and welfare. So you wouldn't want um, necessarily certain uh, industrial uses um, mixed in with residential uses. And so there was a compelling interest at the time to start dividing uses into zones. And the court recognized this and said that it's a valid exercise of the police power for governments to institute zoning, thereby restricting property rights. All constitutional. Now, at some point, um, when government starts restricting property rights, uh, that those restrictions amount to a taking. And uh, under the Fifth Amendment, uh, private property cannot be taken without just, just compensation. So if, if, if the government takes property, uh, the government has to compensate for that taking. And we're going to talk about three forms of, of taking. Uh, the first being eminent domain, the second uh, being regulatory takings, and the third, which isn't really a taking, but it sort of falls into the classification, is uh, uh, the third, third being monetary exactions. Okay, so the, the, most, the most common um, and the most easily understood concept of a taking is when uh, the government exercises its its power of eminent domain. Governments are governments have the authority to exercise eminent domain, um, um, and historically, um, the power of eminent domain. Let me step back for a second. Eminent domain has to be exercised based upon some sort of public purpose. So historically. Uh, public purposes for which the, the power of eminent domain, the authority for eminent domain has been exercised it is for public works projects. And I think everybody can understand what these means. It's roads, bridges, uh, schools, government buildings, government hospitals, sort of the things that, 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 uh, that society needs to collectively function. Um, the government, when, when advancing a public purpose, has the authority to seize land and when it does so, it has to provide um, just compensation for that seizure of land. But that 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 authority is is as absolute. Um, um, it, the government doesn't have to ask for permission to seize land when it's exercising eminent domain for a public purpose. It just has the inherent authority to do it as long as it provides compensation. So over time, the concept of um, public purpose has, um, has evolved. Um, so, and, and the first sort of really significant evolution of what amounts to a public purpose for which the power of eminent domain may be exercised uh, as um, announced by the Supreme Court came in 1954 in the case of Berman versus Parker. In that case, um, uh, DC, the, the, the District of Columbia wanted to uh, acquire uh, private property to redevelop a, to redevelop a blighted area. So you had an area of the city that was in blight. Uh, in, other, in other words, it was substantially run down. It was infested with crime. Uh, many of the, the, the residents were, were vacant. Um, and uh, the, the, the the government saw this as a um, as a threat to public safety, health, and welfare, and therefore exercised the power of eminent domain to redevelop the area and fashioned this as the public purpose for which it could exercise the power of eminent domain. Um, 
property owners there challenged the government's exercise for this purpose. It wasn't, uh, the government wasn't seizing the blighted area to build a school or construct a highway. It was simply for redevelopment purposes. Um, case went up to the Supreme Court and the court decided that yes, um, uh, there was a public purpose here. Uh, resolving the, it, the blight issues uh, was a public safety issue that was a valid public purpose for which the power of eminent domain could be exercised. Uh, and therefore, the court um, um, affirmed this use of eminent domain to seize um, these properties for redevelopment purposes. The next big um, evolution in the authority for eminent domain came in, hey, 19, Paul, I mean in 2005. Yes. Paul? Um, yes. Is eminent domain used uh, as an excuse for gentrification? Ah, hold that question till I explain the next case because uh, the answer to that may be yes. And then um, another other question so, was who? who, who who decides on what's just compensation? So, um, good question. Uh, at the outset, normally the government agency that is um, um, exercising eminent domain will uh, set a value, and uh, in this and this comes down to to um, how different. Uh, statutes for condemnation are written, but ordinarily what, what, what happens is if a property owner is dissatisfied with the uh, compensation that is offered by the government, um, the, the property owner has the authority, has the ability to take that determination to court, and then the, the, the court will decide what the what just compensation is. And, and normally it's it's based on you know fair market value of the property. Um, so if and, and, and the property owner would have to prove what fair market value is and that 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 value is uh, more than what the government has offered. Um, and I hope that answers that question. Um, okay, so the, the the next big evolution in the power of eminent domain came in the uh, Kilo versus City City of New London case. This case was um, uh, sort of an evolution of the Berman case. Uh, though it did not deal with blight, and therefore it wasn't um, an issue of public safety. So in, in Kilo, the city of New London um, had a redevelopment plan for an area of the city that was um, was residential, uh, was uh, working class, um, was perhaps underutilized, uh, perhaps had a um, had higher um, economic development potential than, than what the, the area was being used for. And so the city envisioned um, uh, um, taking title to the, um, the land in this particular neighborhood and had a redeveloper who was gonna come in and make a higher use of, of the land. Um, um, think commercial, residential, um, that sort of thing. So and and so the city the city justified it, uh, exercising eminent domain all, uh, for economic development purposes and, and and everything that comes with that higher tax base so forth and so on. So so the um, the property a, a pool of property owners that um, that uh, were going to have their property seized challenged this as an invalid exercise of eminent domain because it because it was not a legitimate public purpose, they argued. Um, it wasn't for health, safety, and welfare. It wasn't meant to provide a, uh, a public facility. It wasn't for a highway. It, it, the justification was just economic development. Case went up to the Supreme Court, and in, in a very controversial five to four decision, um, the Supreme Court ruled that economic development was a valid public purpose for which governments could exercise the authority and the power of eminent domain by, by providing just compensation. So um, 
So this gets to the question of gentrification. So the short answer to that is, depends on how you define gentrification, but broadly the answer to that is yes. So, a gov so as long as there's an economic development purpose, uh, governments do have the authority to seize land uh, for those for those purposes. Now, the consequence of this decision um, have been um, significant. So, um, just because the Supreme Court says that uh, a government entity has a, an authority to exercise a certain power doesn't mean that um, that there's a consensus that the government or gov government's authority governments should exercise such power. So in many jurisdictions across the country, um, through local law, um, uh, communities have uh, restricted this authority um, and have have passed local laws that say that no, our our municipality or our city, or our county uh, will not exercise the power of eminent domain for these purposes, and that's and that's perfectly legitimate. All, all the Supreme Court says is that said is that governments have this authority. Uh, governments don't necessarily need to act upon the authority. So I hope that I hope that is clear. I hope that makes sense. So Paul. Uh, yep. When you, when using eminent domain for the purpose of economic development, does that mean uh, does that does the development need to occur in a general sense, meaning some type of large development, or can it be a singular commercial recipient? Can government take land through eminent eminent domain to give a singular commercial interest? Yeah, so it's a good question. The, the Kilo case doesn't draw any distinctions along those lines. Um, um, I can't say that, that I'm specifically aware if there's been any uh, jurisprudence on that exact question. What I would say is under the principles of Kilo, um, um, my sense is the answer to that question is no. Uh, in other words, um, it, it, there there is no scope limitation or mm -hmm. um, or 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 floor. There's no minimum minimum scope for which, um, under the principles of Kilo, where a, a government can exercise the power of eminent domain through through an economic development purpose. I hope that hope that answers the question. Uh, one more. Uh, what is the difference between urban renewal to eminent domain, if any? The difference between urban renewal versus eminent domain. Um, I, I, they, they, I wouldn't say there's a difference. I, I, I would say that um, it, um, local governments often use the power of eminent domain to advance urban renewal purposes. So um, that gets sort of back to the, uh, you know, the, the Berman case. Um, that was an urban renewal project. Uh, where you had a blighted a blighted community, the government wanted to step in, seize the property, seize the property for uh, redevelopment purposes, and and that would that would fit within the, you know, the, the construct of urban renewal. Okay. Um, Paul, you have to. So so that's so eminent domain is is the is the. Uh, the easily understood concept of taking it's when government actually seizes title to land um, and repurposes it. Um, uh, the, 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 the second um, aspect of what's known as, as, as takings jurisprudence comes in the realm of, of regulatory takings. Um, so a regulatory taking is when the impact of a law or regulation or an ordinance or a code, some sort of a governmental enactment, when when the when the the impact of that enactment is is um, is the taking of property. Um, so um, so if 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 you just think about it conceptually, um, if um, if um, under zoning laws, if there are 
height restrictions in, um, in, a, in what can be built in a certain zone. Um, those restrictions have removed some of the bundles of rights for that property. I can't now build as big of a building as I want on the property because of, of the zoning limitation. And so the question is, 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 the, is the effect of that limitation, government imposed limitation, a taking of property for which compensation is due? Um, so the court started looking at this question um, in, in 1922, the Supreme Court, that is, in 1922, in Pennsylvania Coal versus Mahan. Um, that case, um, Pennsylvania Coal owned a large tract of land. It subdivided off part of it and sold um, the surface rights to this gentleman, Mahan, um, but um, um, retained the subsurface rights for uh, mining purposes. This transaction happened in the late 1800s. So Pennsylvania coal owned land. Um, and then on the adjoining land that Mahan had the surface rights to, Pennsylvania coal owned and retained the subsurface rights. Um, uh, later on uh, in 19 teens at some point, uh, Pennsylvania passed a law that forbade the mining of coal, if the effect would be to cause um, a subsistence of residential land. So in other words, if you mined coal and um, subsurface mining, and the effect of that could cause uh, residences to collapse into the, into the ground, then, uh, then that, was, that was rendered illegal. Uh, the coal company um, saw this as a taking of their subsurface rights um, and it, that it, it completely uh, uh, shut off all possibility of them um, mining this property because Mahan had built a residence on, on the land um, and took this challenge all the way up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court agreed. The Supreme Court said that um, Pennsylvania's coal's sole interest in these subsurface rights uh, was in the coal. And the effect of this law was to completely eliminate its interest in the coal, that it could not mine the coal because of this law. Um, and therefore, the court ruled that they would do just compensation for the taking of their property. Now, interestingly, the court sort of, in this case, sort of uh, um, pontificated a bit. And it, 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 in, its, in its rationale, it said that um, while certain, obviously certain private property regulations are permitted, um, the court said, if regulations go too far, it will be recognized as a taking. But the court didn't in any way define what it meant by too far. So after Pennsylvania coal, there was a lot of confusion about what that meant. In other words, how much of my bundle of rights does the regulation have to sort of seize uh, before it would be, amount to an actual taking of my property for which compensation would be due? So this court started answering to this, this question some decades later in uh, Lucas versus South, South Carolina Coastal. So in Lucas, a 1992 case, um, Mr. Lucas had, had purchased uh, three uh, beachfront lots in Isle of Palm, South Carolina. Um, in, uh, um, I, I don't know when he purchased them. It was some decades before this case. And uh, it was three separate lots. And his intent, uh, he built, a, he built a, a home for himself. They were all buildable lots when he purchased them. He built a home for himself on the middle lot, and then on the two other lots, his, 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 his intent was to keep those lots for his children, and then at some point, um, uh, give those lots to his children, and then they could build homes on those lots. Some years later, after he had uh, built the first home, um, um, the state of South Carolina passed a, passed a law that created a South Carolina Coastal Commission with the authority to regulate um, 
beachfront property for purpose for environmental protection purposes. Um, the commission passed um, uh, a regulation that drew a line um, across um, Mr. Lucas's property, which which basically said anything to the seaward side of the line was now you cannot develop, you cannot build on anything seaward of this line, anything behind the line was still was still build, buildable, and this was all meant to protect. Um, um, you know, beachfront property, dunes, that sort of thing. So uh, Mr. Lucas saw this as a taking. Uh, the, the effect of the regulations were to render these two, his two additional lots uh, unbuildable. He could no longer build anything on those two lots. Um, and the Supreme Court, the case went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court agreed with Mr. Lucas. Uh, and in doing so, um, the Supreme Court created what, what's known as a categorical rule for toll takings. So if the effect of a regulation is a, is a total taking of property rights, in this instance uh, was to remove all economically viable use of the property, completely removed the, uh, the, ability, the ability to residentially develop this property, then that was a total taking for which compensation was due. Paul, quick question. Yep. Uh, on the last one, the, on, on the slide before, uh, why was the case of versus Mahoning um, and uh, not against the state of Pennsylvania? The take uh, over was the state's doing, wasn't it? Um, who owned PA coal? Uh, the compensation. Why? What, what the state of Pennsylvania was a was a litigant in that case, but. Um, the, the the litigation started by Mahan, who was the resident, who was the surface rights property owner. It actually started with him suing Pennsylvania Coal for an injunction to stop Pennsylvania Coal from mining under his property. Um, so that's why the property owner was a party. Um, if I'm recalling correctly, Pennsylvania Coal then. Um, um, Cross sued and brought the state into the case. Okay, uh, who who owned, who owned PA Coal? The compensation in, the, in that scenario. So ultimately, so if if it, um, ultimately it was the state of Pennsylvania. Okay, thanks. Because the effect of the statute was a was a taking of Pennsylvania Coal's subsurface rights. Okay. All right. So so that's a categorical rule and that's sort of easy to understand if um if the effect of a regulation is to remove basically all of my bundles of rights, um all my you know all my economic interest in the property, then a taking has occurred. Uh, and, and that and that seems to make complete sense and um, and is easy is easy to grasp. What 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 is what is more nuanced, uh, more difficult to grasp, less easily understood, and frankly, um, uh, not well defined by the courts um, is 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 when does a partial taking occur, and when does a partial taking occur arise to the level where um, there needs to be just compensation. So um, Penn Central Transportation versus uh, the city of New York, uh, th this involved um, Grand Central Station, Grand Central Terminal in New York. Um, um, Penn Central um, had, uh, let me back up a second. So uh, the, the city had had enacted, like most, like a lot of jurisdictions, had had enacted an historic preservation ordinance that had an historic preservation commission um, that um, place, you know, uh, limitations on how historic structures um, can be um, can can be altered, and um, Penn Central. Uh, 
excuse me, a Grand, Grand Central Terminal was one of those structures through which the Historic Preservation Commission um, had had jurisdiction. So under any um, alteration to Grand Central Terminal had to get the approval of the Historic Preservation Commission. Um, following uh, the, um, the creation of the Historic Preservation Commission and the enactment of the Historic Preservation Ordinance, this company, Penn, Penn Central Transportation Company, purchased Grand Central Terminal. Um, and some years later, after uh, Penn Central had purchased Grand Central Terminal, uh, Penn Central had a um, idea to construct an office building, a 50-story office building on top of uh, Grand Central Terminal. This proposal had to go to the Historic Preservation Commission, um, and the Historic Preservation Commission denied the application to build this story um, structure. Um, and Central challenged um, the denial as a taking of their property rights. The effect of the ordinance was to take their interest in the property. The court, uh, the Supreme Court disagreed with this. The Supreme Court um, uh, concluded that that they, they it wasn't a total taking because they still had the ability to operate Grand Central Terminal, um, and that was um, an economic interest um, and was was wholly expected at the time that Penn Central acquired the property. And then the court, in questioning whether uh, or in determining that not being permitted to construct the 50-story office tower uh, was not a taking, looked at what Penn Central's investment-backed expectations were. And what they concluded was that when Penn Central purchased the property, they were aware of the Historic Preservation Ordinance, and so they knew that there were limitations. And so their investment-backed expectations weren't necessarily to be able to, uh, to, to, to construct a 50-story office tower on top of Grand Terminal. Um, and therefore, the court concluded that this was not a taking um, and, and that um, there was no need for, for Penn Central to be compensated in any way. Um, they were not denied all economically viable use of the property. Um, Similarly, um, the court in this next case, Tahoe Sierra Preservation Council, um, refused to adopt any sort of per se rule for what would amount to a partial taking. Um, and this case involved a moratorium on residential construction in Tahoe while um, um, the community there was developing a comprehensive plan. And, pro and, and it was taking quite a bit of time to develop a comprehensive plan. The property owners were getting agitated um, that, they, that they couldn't um, sell, they couldn't develop any property, they were losing value, uh, and, and therefore they claimed that, that, that this moratorium was a taking of their property rights. Um, and the court said no, that, that, that they still had, um, they still had um, sufficient property rights and, and it did not amount to it. Okay. Um, any questions out there, Chuck, on yeah. on uh, regulatory takings? Well, the one the one question that that's left here for me to to cover uh, is there a point between a residential economic use crossing over crosses over to a commercial? What's divided? I guess the the question is is uh, is there any distinction in the court cases of uh, of you know taking uh, of property rights? terms of the economics versus just residential yeah. use of property, the benefits of that. And I guess you've kind of touched yeah, I think, a little I think bit on that. The, that the, uh, um, the, yeah, the application would be the same um, because, so you, so you look to the zoning, right? Um, and, and if, you know, let, let's make it simple um, and, and think of it in the, in the, um, in the, um, the Lucas context, so let's say that that the, the property owned, let's say Lucas's property was zoned commercial. And so he had the right to, you know, uh, put up an ice cream 
um, operation. Um, if the effect of the regulation was to um, limit his ability to construct his ice cream store um, on his beachfront property, then that would have resulted in a take. So the analogy is the same. If if it's if it's residential property and the effect of the of the regulation is to remove those um, uh, those building rights completely, then it's going to be a take. Same thing on, uh, you know, commercial industrial side. If I if I've got property that's zoned commercial, property that's in zone industrial, and there's there's a regulation that completely eviscerates those rights, the the the, the, the analysis is going to be the same. That's going to that's going to amount. The distinction in the Penn Central case was that Penn Central retained. Um, their ability to operate the Grand Central Terminal, which was what they purchased in the first instance. Um, so, so the effect of the historic preservation ordinance wasn't to remove all the bundle of rights. Okay, so now we'll segue to um, what's known as exactions. So uh, oftentimes uh, building permits, uh, special exceptions, um, you know, uh, land use permits uh, come with conditions. Um, uh, you know, if you um, if you're going to remove um, a forest stand to build a residence, you have to provide two to one mitigation. That sort of thing. Um, uh, so th this is this is this is local government stuff. Um, it is it is routine, um, but you have to be careful in what those exactions look like because sometimes the exactions can be deemed unconstitutional and invalid, depending on what their scope and what they and what the exactions actually do. There's no the the, the ability to place a condition on a permit on some sort of land use um, approval is not unfettered. And uh, the rule comes from two cases, Nolan Dolan, and it's called the rough, it should be the, the, the rational nexus and the rough, rough proportionality. So the Supreme Court's decision in Nolan versus California Coastal Commission created what's known as the rational nexus. There must be a rational nexus between the condition that's placed on the permit and the governmental purpose for requiring the condition. So in, in Nolan, um, uh, there was in uh, this community, um, beachfront community, there was a ordinance um, that was a view shed ordinance. And the, what the view shed ordinance said uh, was that it, the, the purpose of the view shed ordinance was protect the view of the, of the water of the of the beach from public waves. Um, so Mr. Nolan owned a piece of property, beachfront property, um, adjacent, and he had you know, it was, there were there was a road, um, and there, and his and his his property was between um, the beach and the road. Um, and so um, the, the the view shed ordinance required certain conditions. Uh, in order to um, it, it, for any building permit um, to that would that would inhibit the view from the road to the beach, and uh, the condition that Mr. Nolan wanted to build a house on his his buildable lot. So the the effect of the ordinance couldn't be to prohibit him from building because he had a buildable lot. Um, so he had the right to build. And uh, the, the condition that was placed on his, per, his building permit was that he had to deed to uh, the city a um, right of way from the public road across his property to the beach. And Mr. Nolan looked at this condition and said, wait a minute, this has to do with access to the beach. The condition has nothing to do with view shed. Um, so um, he challenged the condition and went all the way up to the Supreme Court 
and uh, the Supreme Court agreed with Mr. Nolan. Uh, the Supreme Court said that requiring a easement for public access to the beach didn't advance the purpose of the view shed ordinance, was to, which was to protect the view. What might have advanced the purpose of the view shed ordinance would be to perhaps restrict the height of, of, of what residential construction could look like or the size, um, those sorts of things. But requiring an access perm, an access easement had nothing to do with the view shed. And therefore there was no rational nexus between the condition and the justification for the, 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 the statutory justification for the, um, for the condition. So that's the rational nexus test. The, the, the condition has to serve the purposes of, of, the, um, of the, the, the regulatory purposes. The next case um, which created the rough proportionality test was Dolan versus City of Tea Guard in 1994. And this one basically concluded there needs to be a proportionality between the burden of the condition and the problem that the condition is meant to address. And so um, in City of Tea Guard, uh, Mr. Dolan owned a bike shop. The bike shop was situated along a floodplain of a, of a creek, a stream. Um, um, it had a, a parking area that was located in the floodplain. Um, and there was sort of protected, um, um, protected uh, stream buffer in the area. And uh, Mr. Mr. Dolan wanted to expand his bike shop a bit and increase his parking. Um, and in order to do this, um, he needed, um, he needed, uh, he needed an, a uh, permit and an exception to the, um, to the, the, the building restrictions in the flood. And the purpose obviously of that, it was to protect water quality, to, to, to make sure that there's not increased runoff from paved and impervious surface. Um, um, and those were, the, those were the statutory purposes to impose, uh, to, to impose the, the, the limitation and the, um, the, the requirement to get a permit. So the city issued his permit, but placed a couple conditions on it. Uh, the first condition was that Mr. Dolan had to construct a and, and to deed a bike path um, from the downtown area to his bike shop. And the second condition was that he had to um, purchase a property and uh, dedicate a, a greenway of some considerable size um, to compensate for the additional like impervious surface that he was adding for his parking lot. So with respect to the, um, the, um, the bike path, the court said under the Nolan rational nexus principle that there was no, there was no rational nexus between requiring a bike path and the, the for stormwater management purposes of the, of the permit requirement. Uh, so that was based on rational action. Then the court looked at the greenway requirement. And what the court considered was that this was going to be very expensive. Um, it was quite substantial. Um, that um, Mr. Dolan had, there was already stormwater management on site that was going to substantially mitigate any additional runoff from the proposed additional construction and impervious surface. And so the court concluded that the onerous requirement to dedicate the greenway and the substantial cost was out of proportion um, to the harm that was meant to be addressed. Um, it was it was simply it was simply too much and too onerous for the minimal impact that the additional impervious service would would create. And so that's the that's the rational nexus rough proportionality test. A condition is a, a condition placed on a, a permit of some sort, a building permit, some other land use permit, uh, will be valid if it 
uh, if, it, if it's rationally related to the sort of regulatory purpose for the permit um, and the condition, and there is a, and, and the, the, the burden that it causes the landowner is proportionate to the public interest that the condition is meant to serve. Chuck, any questions about that? Yeah, so the one question is, uh, has rational nexus requirement for such things as school impact fees recently come into question? Um, I can't say specifically, but I, I, you know, I could imagine where it would be. Um, so it, it could, I, I, I can imagine where school impact fees, if they were, were too substantial, uh, could be out of proportion with, I, I, um, with I think the purpose kind of for the, in the next, in the next portion of your discussion about in, impact fees of fees is being too, so this may actually be more uh, aligned with the next section you're talking about in terms of, uh, the fees. Yeah. Yeah. So actually you're right, Chuck. So, uh, under, under, it, on this slide, the DABS versus Anne Arundel County. So if impact fees are, um, set by statute. It's a legislative act. And legislative act acts are um, given um, um, due, uh, given great deference by the courts. So it's a whole uh, you know uh, separation of powers. So if if the if the legislature acts establishes impact fees and a, you know, like a schedule or a scale for impact fees, um, uh, the court is not likely to take issue with those impact fees. They're statutorily established because the, the, the courts will not step on the toes of the legislature. If, on the other hand, fees are project specific, not established through any legislatively created schedule, and are imposed on a project specific or site specific basis by the government authority that is 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 exercising you know the permit authority those are decisions that are what we call quasi judicial in nature they're specific to an individual project and those acts those fees are given less deference. So that, pro that that may answer uh, that that question. So that, so you have to look exactly to how the fee. Yeah, if you have to look to how the fee structure is established. If the fee structure is statutorily established, it's probably going to be good to go when it gets to the courts. If it's not, and if it is administratively imposed, then um, then then the rough proportionality test is is going to apply. Paul, one question on that. Okay. Uh, if you can go back. Uh, was the DABS a, a court of appeals uh, ruling or, or uh, Supreme Court ruling? I guess it, it was a court, Maryland Court of Appeals. It was Maryland, Maryland Court of appeals. appeals. So Maryland's High Court in the DABS case. But but it was it, it, it's it's certainly consistent with um, Supreme Court jurisprudence in the area of of exactly. Okay, so so unless there's any other questions about out there about um, Fifth Amendment and takings stuff, Chuck, I'm going to transition We're here. We're good. Okay, so um, so so the next constitutional consideration to come into play when you're talking about land use and planning and zoning and all that good stuff is Fourth Amendment, which is equal protection. Um, so equal protection is basically you know uh, the laws. Have to apply uh, equally to all, um, and states can't deny a person uh, equal protection of the law. So, what what you have to understand about um, about zoning uh, is zoning is inherently discriminatory, right? So we are discriminating based on uses, based on size, based on bulk. Uh, based on all kinds of stuff like that. 
Uh, we permit um, one use here and across the road, uh, that use is not permitted. So, um, so when, when you look to equal protection law, differing classifications in the law are, are generally permitted as long as there's a, a rational and non-arbitrary government interest to justify the, um, the differing, uh, the discriminators. Um, the courts will apply what's known as strict scrutiny to discriminators that are based on things like race, national origin, and ancestry. So that's where you're getting in trouble, is when your discriminators are a uh, protected class, built on protected classes, or fundamental rights. If you, if, if you have discriminators based on, on First Amendment rights or something, um, that, that that's that that's also subject to strict scrutiny and, and likely not permitted by the courts. But that 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 let that comes into play less when, when we're talking about planning and zoning. So as I said, zoning is inherently discriminating. Um, and you know, if we go back to the very beginning, uh, we talked about the Euclid case and where the court said that zoning is a valid exercise of the police power, and that's all based on the on the premise that there's a rational um basis to discriminate in zoning, a rational basis to, to uh, put a rational government interest to put residential, for instance, in one area and industrial, for instance, in another area and to discriminate on those bases. And um, as long as those, those uh, discriminators are rationally related to a public purpose and are class neutral, then um, then zoning um, differences are, are permitted. So let me go back. Um, what's obviously not permitted is zoning based on um, class-based discriminators. So for instance, uh, this, is, is, this is the analogy I always use. Um, I can't have a, a residential zoning um, uh, based on religion. So I can't have my zoning say that on one side of Main, Main Street, uh, only Catholics can live, and on the other side of Main Street, only Protestants can live. Um, that would be a class-based discriminator that um, violates equal protection. It would not pass the strict, strict scrutiny test because there's, there's no compelling government interest in having that sort of division between Catholics and, and Protestants. Um, <clears throat> now, <clears throat> to carry this thought forward, um, so any such discrimination based on a class is subject, as I said, to strict, strict, strict scrutiny. <clears throat> and strict scrutiny only passes muster if, um, if there's a compelling government interest to create those distinctions. Um, so in the Catholic Protestant realm, the, 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 the analogy I always use is perhaps if you lived in Belfast in uh, 1982, uh, there could be a compelling government interest to separate Catholics and Protestants because of the warring factions that occurred between those populations at that time, and there would there could be a compelling government interest to divide them, and therefore, in that instance, perhaps it would pass strict scrutiny. But in America, in 2020, there is no compelling government interest to divide people based on classifications. So that's equal protection. So pretty simple stuff. Um, if if you if you're if you're looking at a, a proposed zoning ordinance that's making classifications based on how people look or <laughs> what people think, uh, then then you, you probably got a problem. Okay, Paul, got a couple cops. Any questions for about you. that, Chuck? Yeah. So, what about gentrification? So um, it depends on how again how you define gentrification. So if you if uh, um, if your zoning ordinance was based on, say, income level, that might be a problem. 
Um, but um, if you had um, policies in place that encouraged new money, shall I say, to invest in an area, you know, there, there's no, uh, I don't see any suspect classification there. But if, but if you start zoning based on income levels, then, then you got, probably got yourself a problem. Okay, uh, so basically, you know, the, the policies may encourage investment, but you're not just, there, there's, there's no distinction of one of the protected classes and who invests in that area. It's just a, kind of as a result of that. Yeah, I mean, this gets really into um, the weeds of of how um, um, courts look at these issues. So sometimes courts will look to what the motive is behind an enactment. And so if the motive is, let's say the, the, the zoning ordinance doesn't like specifically say blacks can live on this side of the street and can't live on that side of the street, but the zoning ordinance is constructed in a way where the requirements are such that they reflect a motive to have that as the outcome, then it might not pass an equal protection analysis. But that's really complicated and 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 kind of too too complex for. for this. Okay, how are age restricted communities able to discriminate by age? Uh, because age is not a protected classification for equal equal protection purposes in this context. My, my recollection that there also there was a carve out to allow for them in the fair housing law as well. Yeah, yeah, and and um, uh, well, you, you 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 also have to look at what the so you know the, the zoning may not be that that an area is zoned 55 and older, but the development puts those restrictions on the development. And, that, and that's a whole different analysis. It's not, that's not necessarily an equal protection analysis because you have private action. Um, but um, yeah, basically that's not that's not a, um, a protected class. Is there religious zoning okay. for churches? I have a couple more. Is there religious zoning for churches, synagogues, mosques, class neutral? Or is religious zoning for churches, synagogues, mosques, uh, class? Is a class or they? Uh, I guess that's a question. It, if you had religious zoning, yeah. that that like an institutional yeah, zoning, yeah, I think is I, that okay? I, I think that that um, if, to the extent areas are zoned for um, religious purposes, and I'm not necessarily sure that's a zoning classification. Uh, yeah, but, most but times it, it, you allow for institutional zones that that allow for some latitude, maybe in different signage or anything. It doesn't necessarily. A lot of times, are floating zones. Yeah. So, so first is that um, I, I, I suspect that those sort of classifications are not um, denomination specific. So, if you had an area that's zoned. For religious purposes, you want to be able to say Jewish only. That would be subject sub, subject to strict scrutiny, of course. Um, also, um, they're they're and, and you have to forgive me. I I I don't think I've ever read a case specific on this point, uh, but I could see how if you set aside a zone for religious purposes. That there might be a compelling government interest in in doing so and saying this is a religious that this area is zone for mm -hmm. religious institutions. There may be a compelling government interest there. Okay, we're good. We but, can move but, on now. But, but generally, but generally, churches fall within permitted uses of in zones that are are not specifically the zone for religious purposes. So it may be. Um, a, 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 you know, a commercial area where churches are permitted. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, planning and zoning in Maryland. Um, you know, as I think we've covered, uh, Maryland has delegated planning and zoning authority to uh, local jurisdictions. 
counties, charter counties, non-charter counties, and municipalities. I think we've already seen this map, charter and code counties versus non-charter counties. Um, so um, the state has delegated uh, planning and zoning to local jurisdictions subject to certain requirements. Um, and so if, if you uh, exercise planning and zoning, uh, the, the jurisdiction has to have a comprehensive plan. The plan has to implement the state's uh, planning visions. And probably most importantly, there has to be consistency in the, um, uh, the, the local zoning and land use implementation regulations, consistency between those implementations and the comprehensive plan. So what state law says is you, you, you can't put all this thought into a comprehensive plan, um, which doesn't really have the effect of law. Um, the effect of law is in the implementing zoning, subdivision regulations, so forth and so on. So you can't put all this thought into a comprehensive plan and then ignore the comprehensive plan when doing your zoning. Right? The zoning has to be consistent with the comprehensive plan. So basics of a uh, zoning ordinance. Um, okay, so let's talk about uh, let's talk about uh, um, zoning. So there are, there are. Let me go back a second. Yeah. Um, so uh, there there are there are basically two types of zoning actions the first is is known as comprehensive zoning and the second is piecemeal zoning so comprehensive zoning um, is um, generally follows comprehensive planning and this is sort of a holistic look across a jurisdiction at zoning it's a it's it's a legislative act it is uh, accomplished through um, through uh, study and debate and deliberation. It, it's, it's meant to look at um, the whole of a jurisdiction or a substantial part of a jurisdiction and, um, and consider all factors to come to conclusions and determinations as to what a jurisdiction's zoning sort of writ large should look like. Um, and in this sense, it is afforded acts of comprehensive zoning or for or afforded great deference uh, when um, they get challenged in the courts because as I said these are legislative acts um, and, and uh, as I said before legislative acts are um, it, 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 the courts are loath to sort of step on the toes of the legislature. Um, thought zoning is pretty much um, the only thing within comprehensive zoning that 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 often gets Challenged and, 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 and successfully so. Spot zoning is 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 when you think about it, sort of visually, uh, if you have um, like a big area of residential, and then you're going to, to have a, like one parcel zoned commercial, um, where that isn't really contemplated in the comprehensive plan, then um, that's going to be spot zoning, and that's generally disfavored and and will be and can be challenged. Um, Challenged in the courts. In contrast, is piecemeal zoning. Um, piecemeal zoning um, are acts that 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 follow comprehensive zoning, and these are sort of the one-offs. Um, these are when someone comes in and requests rezoning of their property that's already been comp comprehensively zoned. Um, these are pro these are property specific actions, uh, property specific requests that are reviewed on a case by case individual basis. In, in, in such regards, these are quasi judicial actions, um, and therefore they are not afforded much deference. These decisions are not afforded much deference when challenged in the courts. In Maryland, it's very limited, where um, when piecemeal rezoning can occur. And there's only there's really only two instances where it's permitted. 
The first is if there was a mistake in the original or comprehensive rezoning. Um, so if, if the property owner can prove that their property was uh, mismapped because of, because of a mistake, the legislature actually um, intended for their property to be placed in one zone, but when they drew the maps and implemented the legislature's plan, they misdrew the lines, for instance. Um, uh, if a mistake can be can be proven, then then there can be rezoning based on a mistake. The other uh, way to get piecemeal rezoning is if there has been a if there's evidence of substantial change in the character of an area since the original zoning that would justify a change and would be you know consistent um, with with the character of of the neighborhood or the area. Um, and that's very difficult to establish. So this is known as the change mistake rule. The, really the only two ways to do uh, piecemeal uh, zoning in the state of Maryland. Chuck, any questions about that? No question. The other question is uh, a little bit of clarification on the why Prince George's and, and Montgomery County are different. A little bit, if you can, if you hit on that huh. at all. Yeah. So, because they fall under a different statute, that's the short answer. So, um, uh, under Division Two of the Land Use Article is com is a completely separate um, title of the Land Use Article specific to Prince George's and Mon Mon Montgomery County. It sets up a completely different set of rules and structures for how planning and zoning is to be accomplished in Prince George's and Mon Montgomery County separate from all other jurisdictions in the state? That's that's the short answer. Okay, Paul, uh, just to let you know, uh, your your time's starting to get a little uh, short, so well, you'll have to speed her up. I hate to say it. Okay, all right, contract zoning, don't do it. <laughs> that, means, that means don't agree in advance with a property owner uh, as to what, the zoning of their property will be when you're doing comprehensive rezoning uh, in exchange for any sort of benefit or promise. That's called contract zoning and it's not permitted. Um, uh, special exceptions. So um, um, a special exception is, is a conditionally permitted use. Um, so so uh, generally speaking, um, you build into your comprehensive plan, you know, uses for a zone, um, uses that are permitted by right. So if you've got a residential right, you have a residential zone, obviously uh, by right in a residential zone are residential uses. Um, but you can build into your comprehensive plan um, conditional use for residential areas, for instance, that can be permitted by special exception. And a special exception is basically just a request by, by a property owner to exercise one of those conditional uses. Um, so the, so the, the, the example I, I use often is a, a dental office in the middle of a residential area. Um, and you, you, you see this quite often. <clears throat> so if it's contemplated at the time of comprehensive uh, planning, that a conditional use for a residential office, a residential area might be uh, other uses such as a dental office. Um, someone in that residential area can apply for a special, special exemption to permit that use. Um, um, and the require there are a number of requirements, um, but basically the the um, the there has to be a need. When, when, when there comes time to apply for the special exception for that use, it has to be a use that was contemplated at the time of the comprehensive planning um, and comprehensive rezoning. And uh, it has to further the comprehensive plan and it can't have an adverse effect upon adjoining properties any different from if that use were located somewhere else within the zone, which is kind of a complicated uh, principle and, and, and um, you can sort of read this case at your leisure if you want that goes into this principle, um, but I'll skip over it for, for the interest of time. Basically, the thing to know about special exceptions 
is is that um, it, it it is it's something that is is authorized not by right but uh, by exception. In contrast, to special exceptions um, are variances. So variances are permitting um, um, use or construction um, in a place where it's forbidden or not permitted under local law. Um, and so if, if, if I'm forbidden to construct something in a certain location under local law and I want to do it anyways, the only way for me to do it is to get a variance uh, from the, the prohibition to be able to, um, to undertake that, undertake that, that construction. Um, and this is generally um, based on hardship. In other words, you've got a, you've got a, a con by no fault of your own, there's a con condition particular to your property where um, you would be denied the beneficial use of your property if, if a literal, a literal enforcement of the building requirements of the building restrictions uh, were applied. And, and what, and what this gets at is avoiding a taking. So if you literally apply a building restriction in a way that forbids me to exercise a right that I already have, that may be a taking. So I illustrate this here. So what you see here is, is competing building restrictions. Um, you have two setback requirements. The first, there is an existing lot here. Um, where there is a there is a home and a barn on this big lot, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, under local law, there is a setback requirement from a barn, so you can't construct a new residence within a certain um, radius of a barn. And so this this guy here has got this smaller lot and wants to build a home on this joining smaller lot. So he's subject to two restrictions. One. Is the, is the restriction not to build too close to the barn. And the second is the required side yard setback. So the effect of these two restrictions taken together is to basically eliminate the ability to build a residence on this otherwise buildable lot. So if you were to enforce both setbacks, the property owner would not be permitted to build a residence um, and therefore you might have a taking. So the property owner can come in to, uh, for a variance to request relief from one of the one of the the the, um, the restrictions, one of the site that the, the uh, setback requirements uh, to to create space to build the residence. And in this instance, um, the the property owner gets a variance from the side yard setback to be able to build the residence so it complies with the barn setback. So that's a variance. Okay, we'll talk quickly about uh, um, vesting. So, um, so in Maryland, um, once a property owner has received some sort of land use permit by the local authorities, um, that property owner is not vested in that right until the property owner exercises some sort of affirmative um, physical manifestation of, um, of taking advantage of that right. In other words, the property owner starts, starts you know, uh, moving dirt um, to, to exercise his building permit. Um, if, if in, until, until the property owner exercises or vests in that right by, um, by doing something affirmative and physical, um, any change in law that might prohibit or make illegal the um, the permit uh, could operate to eliminate um, eliminate the permit to, to invalidate the permit. So um, in this sense, Maryland is known as a late vesting state. Um, in some states, um, you vest in a building permit and the rights under the building permit at the time that the uh, permit is issued. 
in Maryland, you have to you don't vest in those rights until you actually physically manifest um, the execution of those rights. Okay, um, Board of Appeals, if there's any Board of Appeals members out there, <clears throat> Board of Appeals in Maryland are required for non-charter counties and municipalities. They, they must establish Board of Appeals. Uh, and they are authorized in they are authorized in charter counties and all have established all all charter counties have established boards of appeals. Um, the membership of board of appeals depends on whether you're, you're a non-charter or a charter. Under state law, non-charters and municipalities must have three members who serve for three-year terms and they're appointed by the local executive and affirmed by the local jurisdiction. The, the composition of the Board of Appeals in charter counties are as established by local law. So the local lo, lo, local law controls what the composition of the Board of Appeals. What are the roles and responsibility of the Board of Appeals in charter counties, municipalities? Um, Board of Appeals, um, they hear appeals where an error is alleged in the administrative enforcement or application of local law. They uh, hear special exceptions um, and they hear uh, applications for variances. In charter counties, the jurisdictions of the Board of Appeals are, again, as established by local law. So local law determines what the jurisdiction is. Generally, charter counties have created broader jurisdictions for their Board of Appeals than exists for non-charter. Board of Appeals proceedings, they must be publicly announced. All Board of Appeals proceedings are subject to the Open Meetings Act, means, uh, meaning that closed sessions are, um, are limited. Um, so if you analogize a Board of Appeals proceeding to a trial proceeding in circuit court, um, you know that when you go to trial, you have an open hearing, the jury's sitting there, but when it comes time to decide the case, uh, the jury goes into a deliberation room and no one knows what happens in that deliberation room. It's closed to the public. Um, this is different in a Board of Appeals proceedings. So up until that point, Board of Appeals proceedings look a lot like trials, except when it comes to deliberation. The Board of Appeals will deliberate in open session, um, and that's required under the Open Meetings Act. Um, uh, Board of Appeals proceedings must be recorded, <clears throat> witnesses take an oath, and uh, the procedures are established by local law. In other words, witness testimony, the order of proceedings, the examination of witnesses, all that is, is determined by local law. So as we say, deliberate and vote in open session. Um, the record of a Board of Appeals must reflect the members of the votes. And, uh, the, and decisions must be written by the Board of Appeals. Uh, they must be based on findings of fact and they must have conclusions of law. Board of Appeals proceedings are quasi-judicial, uh, meaning that fact findings are given great deference on appeal. In other words, the courts defer to what, what the boards, just like trials, the courts defer to factual findings but the courts will um, um, will decide cases based on errors of law. So if the Board of Appeals incorrectly apply the law, the Court of Appeals will review those applications of the law. Uh, no ex parte communications. Uh, what this means is Board of Appeals members, you can't have ex parte communications with parties who have um, <clears throat> matters pending before the Board of Appeal. An ex parte communication is any communication where all parties are not present during the communication. So what this means is that if, if, if I'm sitting on the Board of Appeals and I got a case tonight um, involving a variance, and um, the parties to that variance are the property owner and the county uh, planning board. Um, if the property owner gives me a call that afternoon at my office um, and starts talking about the case, that's an ex parte communication. 
And um, as the Board of Appeals member, it's it's your obligation to um, sort of shut that, that communication down as rapidly as you can. And if, if the communication occurs, you have to disclose it to all parties on the record um, and summarize the communication and that cures the communication. Okay, so. So we're moving forward. We don't have any question for you. We got to get our ethics done. Okay, ethics. I always do this real quick because I always run out of time. Um, so um, state ethics laws um, are meant for, for two purposes, um, to prohibit improprieties, in other words, self-dealing principally, uh, government officials acting in self-interest, and to avoid appearances of improprieties. So we don't like people taking advantage for personal gain of their public office. And we also don't like circumstances that might appear to be, in, uh, might appear to, to create improprieties. If, even if in fact, there is no self-dealing. Um, counties and municipalities must enact state ethics provisions that are consistent with, with excuse me, must enact local ethics provisions that are consistent with the state ethics provisions. And these have to do with conflict of interests, financial disclosure and lobbying. So there must be ethics provisions on these areas. Okay, so all these, this next series of slides basically talk about what state, uh, what, what uh, employees and officials can't do, they can't, and it all comes down to safe dealing, self dealing. You can't have private benefit that ignores from your official actions. So you can't directly benefit from um, actions of your office. Uh, you can't hold outside employment that would that would render your official duties impartial. Um, you can't use the prestige of your office for for private gain. You can't use confidential information for your own benefit. Um, there are certain actions that you can't do unless exempted by the, by the State Ethics Commission, and, and those are listed here. Basically, you can get exemptions for holding certain types of outside employment, but those have to be cleared through the State Ethics Commission. <clears throat> gifts, you can't solicit gifts uh, based on your um, your position, um, and a gift is anything more than $25 or $20 in value. And there are certain post-employment um, limitations. Uh, you know, you can't go to work for an entity that you regulated, for instance. You can't go to work for that entity immediately after leaving your uh, regulatory role. <clears throat> Recusals, I think there was a question about this. So yes. Anything, if, if you are serving on a planning commission or a board of appeals and a, and a matter comes before you for which you, you or a member of your family may have an interest, um, pecuniary or otherwise, uh, you should recuse yourself from that, um, from that matter. So for instance, I think the question had to do with um, a, a development permit uh, for your neighborhood, there's, there's a development within your neighborhood. Um, uh, so let's say, uh, you know, the, 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 that may affect the issuance of that permit, may affect your property values in some way or could affect your property values in some way. Uh, that's a matter that you should recuse yourself from and, and play no role in, in, in any sort of deliberation or determination on that on that, um, that, that matter. If you, if you determine that you need to recuse yourself from something, you should take no part in it. You should disclose that you have the conflict and you should, you should remove yourself from the room. Okay. Any questions on state, the, the, the State Ethics Commission website is a really good source for, um, information on state ethics laws. They've got the, all the statutes up there. They answer questions, there's facts, FAQs up there. Um, so it's a good place to go as a first stop for ethics questions. Okay, Paul, uh, I gotta, uh, I'm gonna be going through the questions real quick, but one here, um, 
if, if a mayor of a small municipality is an active realtor, uh, is he allowed to deal with properties inside his municipality? I'm, I'm sorry, ask that again. That again? Is, if the mayor of, of a small municipality is active as a realtor, is he allowed to deal with properties inside his municipality? Yeah, so when you get to um, the executive of a, or and, the, and this legislator, um, different rules apply beca because of, of their roles and authorities. Um, so the, the state ethics rules deal with public officials. Um, so I, I'm, I'm hesitant to answer the question on the mayor or a legislature, because I said different rules apply to them. They have different um, disclosure requirements. Um, and ultimately, those people are subject to the wills of the voters. So different rules apply to them. So um, you can go to the Ethics what we're Commission as well. In terms of state ethics laws are, are non-elected public officials. OK. So one quick, uh, following a public hearing where the BZA uh, heard and decided a case, can the BZA draft a decision for the court, the case over the f email or phone and sign the decision without returning to the public session? Um, I, I want to make sure I understand the question correctly. So normally what happens at a, at a, at a Board of Appeals, a Board of Zoning Appeals case is that the, the, the body deliberates in open session, it comes to a decision, and then generally speaking, the written decision is drafted thereafter. And oftentimes at the next session, the board will approve the uh, written decision. And so I guess the question is whether that procedure of adopting the written decision can be done in a different way. In other words, not at a meeting. Is that the question? Right. Yeah, so and maybe this is a COVID related question. <laughs> so uh, there are ways to, um, to, do, to do that through voting. Um, outside the confines of an open meeting that are permitted, but um, this really strays more into Open Meetings Act guidance. And, and um, the, the, my answer is yes, there are ways to do that, but you, can, you should consult with um, uh, whoever advises that board um, on the proper way to do that. Okay, one last question. I think you answered this. If the neighborhood is building an addition, excuse me, if a neighbor is building an addition and you're on the planning commission, should you recuse yourself from voting on the amendment to the final plan for that property? Yeah, that, 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 could, be, that could be a difficult question. It depends on what the impact of that um, addition is on you. So how close is that to you? I mean, if you're all the way on the other side of the neighborhood and you can't see it, and it will have no impact on your property values, you may not have a conflict, but it could be perceived as a conflict if let's say it's kind of contentious and you know, allowing the addition might set a precedent, might set a new precedent for additions in that neighborhood, and therefore perhaps it would be perceived as a conflict of interest. I, I would need to know more about that circumstance before rendering um, sort of a thought on that. Okay, one, this is the final question for us, and then we're going to move on to the, the, the final ones, and I'm going to zip through those quickly. Um, if you live in a condo, uh, and are, are you allowed to raise HOA issues to the zoning board? Uh, or, or commission um, in, in that process? Uh, generally, no. Um, HOA or HOAs are, are, are governed by the HOA agreement. Um, so it depends on what you're really, what the question's driving at. 
Um, there are certainly rule state, you know, state and local rules that that govern the administration of of HOAs and the establishment of HOAs, but sort of the internal minutia of what you can and cannot do consistent with the the homeowner the HOA agreement that's governed by the HOA. So bottom line is you should probably keep the HOA issues separate from anything that's being di uh, discussed or if you're on a planning commission or being uh, debated about by uh, the planning commission that process. Okay, we're going to be closing this out and we're going to go to these review questions really quick. In fact, I'm not even going to vote. How, how, I'm going to just breeze through these things. The power of the police. I'm, I'm not even going to let people vote because I got moving forward. Uh, authority to regulate, uh, uh, public protected. Um, so you select all that apply. The basis of zoning, land use, uh, police power is authority to regulate police uh, protection. That's the first one. Basis of zoning, yes. Ability to disobey, no. Uh, delegated by the state to communities, yes. Next. All right. Okay, moving on. Okay, we, have, we have to blister through. Sorry about uh, development rights. When is it? Uh, what What is it? Construction is completed. Uh, applicant wears a three-piece suit. Changes are visible, discernible, give, giving notice to the public. Public notice is print and paper. It should be discernible. Exactly. Next one. A regulatory taking occurs when your lawyer says so. The use is not permitted under the current law. The regulation removes all economic value to the property when it is determined that a variance is needed. Regulatory is, is yes, 100%. Got it. Paul did a great job on that one. Next one. Uh, an unconstitutional exaction occurs when uh no nexus between the exaction and the government governmental purposes or for the exaction both rational nexus and rough proportionality between the exaction band leader brains on the contract that was relating to the one con uh you um no unconstitutional occurs when there's no national re no records actually i think it's b uh unconstitutional is both the rational nexus um moving on Uh, hearing before the board must be recorded, have testimony taken under oath, cater, include vo a recorded voting or failure to vote by each member, all the above or A and C only? And the answer is A and C only is the answer. Uh, ex parte communications for the properties um, should be encouraged to gain additional information for decision makers disclosed to all parties and summarized on the record rewarded by approval of variance kept secret from the public under executive privilege the answer is disclosed it should be coming yes disclosed got it excellent and any more i think we might be done i hope i hope hope that was it all right thanks um and without further ado we're going to take this over to uh uh to joe G griffiths and he is going to talk about uh comprehensive planning and the role of the comprehensive planning commission welcome joe thank you chuck let me set this up Okay, uh, as Chuck mentioned earlier, my name is Joe Griffiths. I'm the local assistance and training manager for the Maryland Department of Planning. Uh, because of due time, I'm gonna have to go through this pretty quickly. I'm gonna forego my questions. John, I suggest we just forego the poll questions at the end if possible. Uh, and I do have, uh, hopefully, I'm glad they stuck around. I have some special guests. I would like to give a little bit of time to speak at the end. I appreciate their patience uh, and the time window I gave them. So I'm gonna talk about um, comprehensive planning. Okay, so um, 
planning values that are uh, encapsulated in a comprehensive plan. So prote protection of public health, self safety and welfare. Uh, this includes things such as water resources, fair housing, public facilities, uh, resource conservation, resources such as land, water, historic, and many other different kinds of resources. A well-designed functioning built environment could include a mix of uses, supportive infrastructure for growth, um, predictability and transparency. Uh, many different groups use uh, a comprehensive plan such as staff, the planning commission, elected officials, and the public, including community and developers. And it's very important in decision making. Uh, and then finally, public participation, a key aspect of comprehensive planning, uh, which leads to better governance, a buy-in from the community on the plan you created, and enhanced knowledge by all stakeholders. So what are the planning commissioner's responsibilities? Uh, the land use article section 3-201 says a planning commission shall prepare a plan by studying the present conditions, projections of future growth and relation to neighboring jurisdictions. So they do have a duty to prepare a comprehensive plan and present it to the local governing body for their consideration and adoption. So Maryland has 12 planning visions. There are seven original visions established by the 1992 Economic Growth Resource Protection and Planning Act. Five more were added with subsequent leg legislation. Uh, so these are visions, so they're broad, uh, but all Maryland comprehensive plans are required to embody these 12 visions. Okay, so um, what does, what are the key components of a comprehensive plan, at least broadly? So it should include the community's vision for the future. Where do you wanna go? What do you want your community to look like? Uh, it should also look at the past, present, and future of the community through it, how it evolves where it is now, its current conditions, and what are the trends towards the future, employment growth, population growth. And then finally, it should have goals, objectives, and policy to realize the vision that was established in the first bullet uh, and build upon or respond to the evolution conditions and trends. So how do you do a comprehensive plan? A comprehensive plan guides growth, development, preservation in defined areas. So. Uh, this should include inventories such as demographics, community facilities, transportation networks, acres of land use, analysis such as the road conditions, employment growth, residential capacity, and green and water infrastructure needs. So uh, and it, it needs to include implementation strategies, perhaps the most important part. Uh, these include business incentives, zoning, funding, partnerships, and specific policies and decision making points. And then finally, it needs to adapt over time through feedback and adaptive management. Uh, solid plans measure their success. Now, there are required elements in comprehensive plans. Uh, Maryland statute requires these certain plans and they're, 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 they differ for charter uh, counties, municipalities, and non-charter counties. Um, so here are just a few of, of the examples. I have some more on the other page. So things like water resources includes um, drinking, wastewater, and stormwater resources. A municipal growth element identifies areas outside of the current corporate boundaries of the municipality. This applies only to towns and cities um, for their growth. So they actually plan outside of their existing boundaries. Uh, sensitive areas such as critical areas, wetlands, and habitat areas. And then there are some optional or only required under certain conditions uh, elements. One is the mineral resources element if current geologic information is available. Uh, here are some other ones, land use. Uh, community facilities, such as schools, fire stations, jails, hospitals, community centers, fisheries. Here's another one, only if it fits a certain situation, if it's a, a jurisdiction has tidal waters, uh, areas of critical state concern, development regulations and implementation, uh, and the brand new one that just uh, became effective um, June 1st of this year is a housing element. I just wanna to briefly touch on this. Uh, this requires all comp plans to plan for low income, and uh, workforce housing, and the definitions of that are, are based on ranges of area median income, which is uh, an annual uh, measurement that uh, the Federal Department of Housing and uh, Community, or, community or Housing, housing and Urban Development, sorry, HUD, puts out every year. Just uh, I want to say that we recently published a models and guidelines on our website to help jurisdictions uh, complete their housing element. I'm happy to talk with anybody who likes more interest. I'd like some more information about this at a later time. And then there are also optional elements. The housing element used to be an optional element, but these are other ones that uh, may be considered. Okay, so the comprehensive plan process is not easy. You're often, often dealing with uh, opposing viewpoints, opposing visions. 
Examples might be the, the value of property rights versus the desire to preserve your rural land. Or there may be a, a need or an interest in more housing, but also some others might be concerned with greater density. Uh, so there's a lot of different groups and a lot of different voices you will hear as part of the comprehensive planning process. All right, and it, sh it should involve uh, a variety of stakeholders. Just a few of the list, few of them are listed here. Residents, uh, business people, employers in community, community groups, and other government agencies. Okay, um, so uh, a big part of comprehensive planning are work sessions uh, that, the, that are held at planning commissions. Uh, this is a kind of a deeper dive uh, for, for planning commissioners to look into studies, information provided by staff, uh, on the right here, you see a, a, what we call a SWOT analysis. It's a strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats analysis. A good way to look at uh, look at your community, uh, consider what's going on. A lot of you are probably familiar with these. Uh, these can also be a chance to review a plan draft. Okay, uh, comp plans are not a standalone document. They have uh, impacts on and are impacted by a lot of other planning doc documents. Uh, for example, uh, the Maryland Department of Planning and other state agencies reviews a lot of other planning documents for consistency with the comp plan, so they should be interconnected. Some examples are uh, annexations, uh, need to be consistent with the municipal growth element that I mentioned earlier, educational facility master plans, water and sewer plans, and even the priority letters that counties submit to MDOT, uh, the Maryland Department of Transportation every year, should be and are analyzed and considered for their consistency with comprehensive plans. Uh, Good comprehensive planning also includes interjurisdictional coordination. Cities with the surrounding counties, counties with, surround, with the neighboring counties, even with uh, uh, neighboring jurisdictions in other states if you're part of the same municipal area. Um, specific examples are things like environment, transportation, housing, economic development. All of these planning issues transcend and cross, go across uh, jurisdictional boundaries. And good planning should uh, take these uh, partners into consideration. All right, there is a review process for the draft comprehensive plan. After the planning commission goes through the work sessions, uh, gets their input from the public, all those steps we already talked about, uh, they, come to, they come to a draft that they, they agree on or that they, they, they prefer. They send it to the Maryland Department of Planning for 60-day uh, review. Uh, we also send that out to our sister agencies for their review. Then we compile them all, and we send that, that um, our review to a jurisdiction um, before their public hearing. And then our comments are required to be part of the public record uh, for that uh, public hearing. Then there's a recommendation for adoption, if so chosen by the Planning Commission to go to uh, the legislative body. They also have to have their own public uh, hearing, and but they also can, they, they can modify a plan sent to them by the Planning Commission. Uh, the Maryland law requires at least a review every 10 years uh, of your comprehensive plan. Uh, if you are, say, a municipality that's uh, not growing, hasn't changed much, that review might be all you need. Uh, but if it's uh, a larger jurisdictions tend to have a new or an updated plan at least every 10 years. This often coincides with new census data. So we expect a lot of comprehensive plans to come uh, to be put, get sent to us for review after uh, the 2020 census. Uh, there's a lot of, um, pardon me, uh, there there are a lot of ways that you can get technical assistance. As I mentioned earlier, the Maryland Department of Planning, uh, we, we have a long history of models and guidelines. The newest one is, is uh, housing. Uh, we also have some on a, a, a fairly recent one is placing jobs, economic development uh, and planning. We have a number of them going back to water resources, other state agencies as well. Okay, I'm zooming through this. I appreciate you keeping up with me. I'm gonna specifically talk about the Planning Commission Planning Board Board's role uh, and responsibilities. Okay, it's key to know that you are not alone. Uh, you play a major role in determining future land use and implementing your jurisdiction's comprehensive plans. Um, and these are just a few of the groups that, that uh, you can work with from locally uh, to state and, and elsewhere. All right, uh, you have a formal and informal role defined by the jurisdiction. Um, some of the primary responsibilities of the commission are to help create the local comprehensive plan, as we mentioned, including the 12 planning visions, help and create and apply maps and regulations to implement that comprehensive plan, such as zoning, subdivision, and development requirements. In developing the comprehensive plan, the planning commission follows a process that involves all stakeholders. We talked about that earlier. 
conducts meetings and hearings to receive input on the plan, works with staff in a formal public hearing and informal settings, such as the work session I mentioned, to develop strategies and recommendations for inclusion. You co uh, the Planning Commission coordinates the 60-day review I mentioned earlier, and then again, forwards the plan to the legislative body. Now, planning commissions have different roles depending on whether they are established by charter or not. In non-charter counties and municipalities, planning commissions play an advisory role in relation to zoning ordinances, zoning ordinance changes, changes to subdivision and development regulations, some development approvals such as large PUDs or planned unit developments, and capital budgeting and programs. And in addition to other implementation and growth management tools such as those that were mentioned earlier, land preservation, annexation, development rights, and responsibilities. There are also some areas in which planning commissions have approval authority. These areas may include approval over the use of public land, such as for public streets, parks, and other public purposes. This is done through their authority to review and approve subdivisions and site plans. The authority to review and approve some type of developments, such as minor subdivisions, can be delegated by non-charter counties and municipalities where such delegation is specifically enumerated in the authorizing provisions. And so I definitely encourage anybody uh, of a non-charter county to, uh, to check out what their um, uh, authorizing provisions are, but also for those of charter counties uh, to, to know what, the, what their charter, uh, charters say about their authority. Um, in some charter counties, so I jumped ahead a little bit, in some charter counties, authority for approval of rezonings special exceptions and variances is given to an administrative hearing officer, while other provisions such as review and re recommendation of the capital improvement program uh, are given to the planning advisory board. All right, we talked a little bit about work sessions earlier, but let me just give a few more details. They're normally conducted when a planning commission wants to get more detail on a specific proposal or project than they would normally get in the public hearing process. Work sessions provide time for planning staff and other professionals, such as architects or engineers, to present information and entertain questions from the planning commission members. While work sessions are open to the public, normal public test normally public testimony, testimony is not taken at these. It is important that public hearings of the planning commission be conducted in a fair and consistent manner, so that from meeting to meeting, the public sees a regular process being followed where there's an opportunity for public input. This goes back to the clear uh, and transparency and importance that I discussed with the uh, comprehensive plan portion. Okay, in reviewing the roles and responsibilities of planning commission and board of appeals members, it is important to note the need to review and understand documents being presented at public meetings, hearings, and work sessions, as well as material that is sent to members in advance of such meetings. So there is often, or almost always, homework. Jurisdictions should provide an overview of the type of material being transmitted and how to best use it. This includes staff reports, site plans, plot plans, uh, and other documents such as special studies and reports. Things, this could include transportation studies, traffic studies, environmental studies. Site plans such as the one illustrated here typically show the layout of roads, stormwater facilities, landscaping, and buildings, as well as the tabulation of site data. All right, and my last slide, I specifically want to talk about the septics law. Uh, under the Sustainable Growth and Agricultural Preservation Act of 2012, known more popularly as the Septics Law, local ju jurisdictions are required to identify areas or tiers where new sub subdivisions will be served by either on-site septic systems or public sewer systems. These tiers are based largely on local land use plans, zoning, water, and sewer plans, and adopted agricultural plans and policies. For jurisdictions to allow major subdivisions in areas outside of those areas served by public sewer, those would be tier threes, uh, tier maps must, be, must have been adopted. The Planning Board or Planning Commission has a role when it comes to reviewing major subdivisions in tier three areas, those not uh, um, served by public sewer. Any major subdivision in the tier three area must be reviewed through a public hearing by the Planning Board or Commission. Whether or not that body is currently tasked with review, reviewing other major subdivisions. As part of the review, the Planning Board of Commission shall consider the cost of providing local government services to the subdivision and what impacts the subdivision will have on the environment and natural resources. I'm happy to take questions here in a moment, but I would like to uh, invite, if they're still on the call, uh, we do have uh, 
board members of the Maryland Planning Commissioners Association, uh, a group that I work closely with in, in my role with Maryland Department of Planning. Uh, they've all taken this class before, but they, they offered to be here, at least a few of them, um, to share some information about the MPCA. So, uh, John, if you could unmute those names I gave you earlier. And let me know when that happens. Okay. This is Danny. Hey, Danny. This is the Hi. president. I'll let, introduce yourself. Hi, uh, Joe, just want to let you know I can only unmute uh, Danny. The Hi. other two have self-muted. Okay, so I think it's Roxanne and Doug, you've self-muted. If uh, after Danny goes, you'll have to unmute yourselves. Go ahead, Danny. Hi, good good, um, good morning, I guess we're still in the morning. Let's see. Yes, and um, I'm Danny Winborn. I am president of the Maryland Planning Commissioners Association. I'm happy to be here. And I'm so excited to see that there's a great mix of participants in this uh, webinar. And um, I just wanna just, Give you a brief overview of the planning um the maryland planning commissioners association we were established in 1983 and our current membership is planning commissioners and boards of appear that's our core membership and what our role is is to first of all we're citizen planners so um our role is an information and training and advocacy role and to help share information among all the jurisdictions planning commissioners and boards of appeals and to make sure that that we are communicating um, ideas and activities, but the biggest role that we have is collaboration with the Maryland um, Department of Planning and um, Chuck Boyd and, and Joe and, and all those individuals that we we work with. So I'm very excited to be a part of this process. Um, our core membership right now, as I said, our planning commissioners and boards of appeals, and it's approximately about 1,400 members, so you're automatically a member of the planning commission. And we urge you to reach out to us. We urge you to look at the Maryland Department of Planning's website and communicate with us if you ever have any questions and to participate. It's a, we're a great organization and, and we are um, very focused on making sure that we're promoting planning throughout the state. As I said, I'm the I'm the president, and we have a vice president, Bill Butts. I'm not sure if he's on the line, but he's very active. Um, our secretary is Roxanne Hemphill, and she's extremely um, active. And our treasurer is Doug Wright. And we could not do all the great things that we do without Doug's help. Um, I'm just going to let um, if Doug or Roxanne on. Um, if you could mute me and, and let them speak, I would like for them to you know, have a. a Hi, Danny. This is Roxanne Hemphill. Um, welcome, everybody. Can everybody hear me, Joe? Am I yeah. coming through? Uh, awesome. Um, I am a, uh, uh, a chairperson of a planning commission for the town of Mount Airy. And um, when I first got on the commission, I, I was seeking out other avenues to learn for different classes and courses. Um, and realized I could go to the uh, MPCA conferences and learn from them. And my platform, I guess, if you will, on this conference is um, um, citizen planners need uh, a lot of handholding and a lot of learning of what we do because uh, we're in an area that some of us sometimes aren't real familiar with. I'm a huge proponent of education and my platform basically is education so we are doing that in the mpca we are broadening our education we want as many citizen planners as possible to attend all of our training sessions uh, we do have sectional training as well as a conference coming up which it will be uh, virtual uh, but i do value my time with this group you all are members of the group so welcome uh, and you can as much as you put into this group, you will get out of it. But I have learned an extreme amount. I've had some very complicated issues that I've needed to deal with on my commission. And without this group, I didn't, wouldn't have gotten the research and the information that I need. So it's a very valuable part of planning. And I wish all of you to take uh, advantage of this. That's Thank it. You. Thank you, Roxanne. Any You're uh, welcome. Questions? Yeah, it's great to have you on. Any closing words, Doug? You might be muted still.
Well, I can I can speak for Doug. Uh, Doug is a uh, chair of the Hagerstown Planning Commission and has been for Doug's many years. Doug's mic is open. I'm sorry. Doug, you're active. Doug's mic is open. He can talk if he wants. Well, uh, I will convey some messages from Doug. We do have a board meeting this Friday. Um, and we have a lot of planning for the, the conference, as Roxanne mentioned. We're also going to try to do a, a, a webinar in uh, late summer, early fall, in preparation for that conference. Um, so we, we please look for uh, emails from the MPCA. We also have an article in the Planning Practice Monthly uh, newsletter that Maryland Department of Planning puts up uh, every month. Um, you there, Doug? I'll give you one last chance. Well. I, I promise you, Doug does uh, an immense amount of work for the, the MPCA uh, and uh, keeps us in line. Uh, so thank you uh, to all of you. Um, John Coleman, I suggest we forego the questions because Chuck is going to get into the details of growth management tools. Thank, thank you. Uh, th thank you. Uh, thank you, Joe. I'm going to. Uh, Get moving here. Sorry about that. Hopefully you could see my screen and none of my other stuff is showing. Uh, let me make sure. Um, yes, it's clear. Audi the audience view is clear of all my other stuff. So sorry about that. Uh, so, come on, come on. Oh, there we go. A little slow in here. Um, I am going to breeze through this this section really fast, and forgive me. Uh, just to answer one question that was uh, made earlier about the uh, uh, PDFs uh, will be uh, viewable uh, later on, uh, or, or, or we will send a PDF link. So you can get a copy of all of the slides that are presented here. Um, my job right now is to wrap this up in, in blistering time. Uh, the uh, you've heard about the law, the foundations of planning. You've heard from Joe on the the planning commission's role and the preparing the comprehensive plan. My role right now is to to go over the many tools that are supporting local governments through the planning commission board of appeals. Uh, that can be used to actually um, uh, implement a local comprehensive plan. So the number one tool, the most powerful tool that you have is zoning regulations. Zoning regulations, obviously, money you know about this, it consists of a text and a map. It regulates your density, bulk, size, uh, each jurisdiction, each unit, uh, each district's a little bit different. You you change this, uh, that, so you most of you know very much about zoning. But that's one of your that is your most powerful tool, I would say, uh, in that process. And I'm trying to figure out. There we go. Very slow in this starting this. Okay, um, zoning. Uh, as I said, you have individual zoning districts. Uh, your zoning map. Uh, there are floating zones, there are a variety of different zones available to you. The traditional zoning, Euclidean, bringing that uh, Euclid versus Amla Realty, is, is the traditional zones that are allowed by right. Uh, and they usually often were singular zones. Uh, the problem with singular zones is residents live in one place, the, the employment areas in the other, and it created a lot more traffic. Uh, you know, particularly post uh, 19 World War II, there was a lot more of singular zones created. Most jurisdictions redid their comprehensive plans and their zoning regulations, and and adopted the the standard approach of separating the uses. Uh, that invariably creates more traffic because people don't live where they work. So the more modern ordinances kind of went back to old school, the old, old traditional ways of uh, of having uses of mixed uses of having the uh, retail above the commercial or just a, a conglomeration of uses in a logical manner. 
in addition to the, uh, the, the traditional zoning districts, you, you have overlay zones. Overlay zones can be used to protect your environmental areas. It can be utilized in historic areas to protect your, your historic resources. Could be uh, some type of view sheds and those type of things. So these overlay districts typically are additive regulations on top of those that are normally there to just talk about use. These things usually talk about design or design standards that be applied. So in zoning, uh, the more, more modern approach, the most uh, the, the new wave of zoning is called form-based regulations, really combines a lot of things together. It doesn't care as much about use per se, and so you don't have to get uh, down into the weeds and, and trying to develop, identify every use in a zoning category. It usually lumps them into very general categories. And then really what it focuses on is the public realm. That is, what is the perce perception of the public to the private property? So it really focuses on design standards, uh, setback requirements, performance standards associated with landscaping and other things. So you really focus on the, the, the perception of the use uh, from the public realm and less so on the individual use. Subdivision is your next most powerful tool in the area of uh, um, regulatory improvements. Subdivision is the division of land in one or two lots. Uh, subdivision is what really sets the stage of where development is going to occur. Once things are developed and are subdivided and our lots are sold off, it's very difficult to go backwards. Subdivision is a really critical step in the implementation of local comprehensive planning. Subdivision regulations incorporate street, the street design standards. Usually it's very close coordinated with the transportation plan and, and maybe a functional transportation so that the, the, the width of the, the roads, the, the characteristic of that road, whether or not it's a, a functional road for a major arterial or a local street is identified in your comprehensive plan or in your functional plans, and then it's, it's implemented through the subdivision approval process of division of land, dedication of land for the public right-of-way. Within the right-of-way, you usually have your public utilities, often, often includes uh, your, your landscaping design standards, all of which are incorporated into the subdivision plat and the recreation of that lot, uh, of those lots through uh, the courthouse recreation of, of the plat. Usually we'll have a lot more details on restrictions and, and, and information about easements and other things as well in those plats. The, the third uh, most powerful tool in your toolbox of implementing a comprehensive, comprehensive plan is the water and sewer master plan. It identifies those areas that are going to be served and whether or not they're going to be served in the short term, immediately, or in the longer term. So the, the water and sewer master plan is to be updated every three years in that process. Uh, there, there are a lot of basic things that need to be incorporated into that plan but it basically allows for us to then be able to issue permits, know when a project is, is available. It specifies the cost associated with who's going to pay for that. And all of those types of things are incorporated in, in the water and sewer master plan. So that water and sewer master plan, as Paul mentioned, needs to be consistent with your comprehensive plan. So it focuses a lot on those growth areas. Identifying those growth areas needs to be really consistent with the, that and, and that logical progression of the community. Um, the water and sewer plan really needs to also recognize that, that there's going to be uh, infill and growth areas that are going to occur and, and development changes over time. So a water and sewer plan needs to monitor the water flows, the demand for sewage treatment, et cetera, along the way because uses change over time. So that, that water and sewer master plan is an integral part of your ongoing maintenance of your activities in your community. Often jurisdictions will actually adopt a adequate public facility, adequate public facility ordinances, APFOs, to control development. It's not it's not a, 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 a prohibition of development. It is a management tool. So you can't use an APFO, and you'll often lose in court if you if you try to use an APFO to just create a moratorium that we're going to shut down development. That does occur occasionally if, in fact, the growth is outpaced development, and therefore the APFO could 
kick in or it's intended to, to restrict the flow of development so that adequate public facilities, facilities are added consistently and, 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 and incrementally along the way to ensure that there's predictability in the growth process so that those particular uses um, and, and um, residential development, commercial development occurs uh, approximately at the same time as the use is coming forward. Most schools are, uh, uh, school APFOs uh, have been adopted by all of the 13 counties, the 23 municipalities. Uh, some of the other APFOs are for, for uh, roads, or water and sewer along the way, but again, it's a growth management tool for community. Um, APFOs uh, can be adopted by any jurisdiction. Um, and again, it, it's intended for um, you to, to provide service, but it's not intended to be a reason for you to deny. It needs to be foreseeable in that. Um, and I am out of, of my, my presentation. So I guess I got, uh, let me just check to see where we are on my, uh, sorry about that folks, I'm, I'm uh, trying to get to my other screen. Hit the page up key. Page up. Questions? Okay, thank you. Um, so we're at the at, at the end of our presentation here. Just to let you know that we. Um, oh boy, I don't know how it happened. Okay, sorry. Uh, told you technical uh, deficiency. APFOs. Uh, the uh, uh, Board of Appeals uh, Capital Improvements Program. Capital Improvements Program is another important tool you have. Uh, the CIP. Uh, is uh, approved by the planning commissions. Uh, it, it's a place that you can uh, identify sources of funding for those infrastructure. Uh, so if you want to implement your comprehensive plans, you got to have money for it and your capital improvement program sets forth the scheduling of that. Uh, it's usually the typical process that's often used in the comprehensive plan. You do inventory analysis, identify priorities, uh, establish your, your approved plan, and then you monitor it along the way. Last thing, municipal annexations. Annexations for municipalities this is one of the most important ways for you to grow. You do not have to annex property, but if you want to annex property, you do have some control. So municipalities, this is one of the few times you actually are in the driver's seat. So what conditions of an annexation has to be contigu uh, contiguous to the to the jurisdiction. It obviously can't be already in a, in a municipality. Uh, cannot uh, create a non-type, can't completely surround an unincorporated area. And obviously, have to meet the statutory requirements and notice and along the way. And um, uh, oh, I I I know why I hit my end button. Sorry about that, folks. Uh, um, the uh, uh, rules of development of newly annexed land. You can put restrictions on it. You could put limitations on that annexation along the way. So there are particular visions and possibilities for that. Um, Development rights and responsibility is a very powerful tool. A lot of jurisdictions don't use it. It is a means by which there could be a public-private partnership to establish an arrangement between the private sector and the public. It's a, it, it's a little bit of a quid pro quo. It's a little bit of that uh, contract zoning uh, that typically allowed for five years. Uh, it allows for uh, a developer to give certain things and get a, a predictability, holds the development restrictions in place uh, so that provides some certainty for the development uh, developer to go along. Uh, we have other tools. Encourage you to go to our website. Joe mentioned about our, our planning uh, planning practice uh, monthly monthly newsletter. Important information. We're continuing to enhance our websites uh, along the way and. Uh, Really appreciate that. Um, finally, as I said, you're going to be getting a, a certificate from us and you're going to be receiving a notice of the follow up. Uh, and I want to thank you for joining us. I don't even have a clue what the, the time is. I'm um, hopefully uh, I'm at 1154. I'm going to see if I got any questions. Uh, I do have a few questions here. Um, 
not a, not a, not a question, but a comment. I understand that things are harder under COVID-19, but it's clear that a dry run was not done ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, we're going to continue to do this. We did actually do a dry run, just to let you know. Uh, and uh, there are some tech technicalities, and appreciate the the, the, the observation. So. Um, and again, we're going to make the slides available to you afterwards. I want to thank you so much for being here. Um, and uh, we're going to continue to work improving our technical skills. And uh, maybe you want to make this longer. It wouldn't be as much. So at this point, I want to thank everyone. And uh, please feel free to send us any comments, any suggestions. Uh, please contact your regional planner. Uh, if you have any questions, or even better yet, contact your local planner and then work through them. So I want to thank you so much today. Uh, we encourage you to uh, um, see us and visit us and have a great day. Take care now, folks.